Okay, great. Well, yeah, so <clears throat> I'm Paul Nichols. Um, I started a company called Factory 15 a couple of years ago, and um, we work in um, kind of production design, film direction, advertising, and um, architectural visualization. And I'm going to give you kind of a, a taster of, um, of, of our workflows, really, both creatively and technically, over the next three days. Um, each day is, supposed to, um, is designed to be quite self-contained so that they exist um, as separate kind of like modules almost, <clears throat> focusing on a very different area. Um, but overall, at the end of the course, um, everyone should have a really good idea of how we work and the kind of tools and softwares that we use, basically. So this is kind of a, a, an outline of the, of the next three days. So today we're going to be focusing on um, artwork. And the kind of project that we're using over the next three days is our kind of flagship project, Jonah, um, that we kind of made uh, last year. And um, this is a kind of 20 minute short film um, with a lot of kind of live action and visual effects. But it had quite an interesting development, um, which started off with um, a lot of kind of artwork and kind of content generation, um, which then led fed directly into the kind of visual effects and also the kind of, um, you know, the, the kind of na added to the narrative of what we were talking about in this film. Um, so today we're going to be focusing on the artwork of, 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 um, of this project. So we're going to be talking about the design, the references, creation of the assets. Um, we're going to be focusing quite heavily on, um, on ZBrush today as well. Um, so that'll be quite fun, um, introducing you to that and the different ways that we use that within the kind of artwork. Um, we'll be looking at the scene setup of three different scenes, um, an underwater image, um, a kind of like really kind of abstract sectional image which became the poster for the project and also um, a kind of streetscape of the, of, the roof, of the rooftops. So the idea of these three days <coughs> is to kind of broaden the skill sets for everyone really. Um, there's this kind of growing trend of, um, of kind of a super generalist where instead of being a kind of specialist in one really narrow area, um, more and more people are popping up who are becoming really valuable and, and useful in companies that know a little bit of everything. Um, so this is, this is relevant for kind of like the growing arc viz demands as kind of illustrated here. Um, and architecture visualization is becoming more and more um, like visual effects. It's becoming more sophisticated. It's becoming more, um, you know, it's becoming more um, using different softwares, different techniques. It's not just the kind of straight um, button pushing technique that it was a few years ago. You can no longer get away with being a kind of senior artist in a, in a big visualization studio now with only knowing kind of the base, the base skill set of Max V-Ray and Photoshop. You really have to be a much, a much kind of like a more um, skilled to, uh, create, creative technician um, to be a kind of senior visualization artist these days I'm finding. Uh, but also to kind of open up new avenues, new, new kind of careers in 3D and visual effects. Um, and also to kind of give people a kind of like the skill set to, um, to create their own projects, to be, not, be, not be too narrowed by um, the kind of what you might be doing for, your, for, um, for a company or for your paid work, but also encouraging more of a kind of like do everything yourself attitude to, to filmmaking and, um, and CG. I'll go over that in a second. So today, artwork. So. This project, um, this is the poster for this project, for those of you who, who don't know it. Um, so this project was very much a, collaborate, a collaborative project. We did the, all of the artwork um, over two months for this project. And it was essentially kind of two of us doing, doing the artwork phase and then, and then another one um, working on kind of pre-visualization um, mainly. So it was kind of three of a small team where we did the pre-vis and the um, artwork over a period of two or three months. So the kind of design and inspiration for this project came originally from this, this um, kind of short story, The Hemingway, The Old Man in the Sea. And the, essentially what we wanted to take from this project was um, an idea of kind of the new and the old, an idea of kind of like regret, revenge. Um, and there was lots of aspects of this kind of um, book that we really liked. And it was kind of telling that in a new way, in a, in a place that we could really connect with. So the place we kind of um, started with was Zanzibar. And this was again, um, talking, I'm going to be talking a lot about references and things like that uh, to begin with. And um, what in that story was the kind of sticking point was this old fishing town in, in the book. And we wanted to find a place which really spoke, um, a, kind of gave reference to and, and you know, was a fishing town, but also reflected a bit more of what we wanted to um, say and what we wanted to 
um, show. And, and we wanted someone that was rich visually, a lot of texture, a lot of um, kind of culture. And Zanzibar was a, was a great was a great place. So we shot most of the film in um, in Stone Town. But these are pictures from a recce um, that we took um, before we went to film, obviously properly. Then they had these amazing boats as well. This is another kind of key factor. And the streets were really textured. Um, and we knew when we were going to this recce, roughly, you know. We didn't have a story kind of fully figured out, but we knew we were going to kind of um, add things to the town, um, and it was going to be quite a, a visually rich kind of um, kind of pro project. So these are a few snapshots of kind of like the, the you know the markets and the fishing towns and kind of the, the cultural kind of aspects of it. It also had these amazing kind of long street beaches, which um, had a lot of texture again, and. Um, and then the kind of morning and evening markets were a really busy, bustling area. And we wanted to kind of show how this space could, could change. And that was kind of the, um, the notion of the project. So this is kind of a few of our old, much, much older projects. But again, it's kind of looking at our, what we were about and what our style was and how we could kind of appropriate that within, within this space. Um, so we're looking at all of the kind of detail that we were looking at in our previous work and the kind of textural quality um, that we were trying to achieve um, in our personal projects and how that kind of mirrored with the kind of um, with the texture and the kind of life and the vibrancy of um, of Stone Town itself. So it's this kind of intensity of kind of um, information that we kind of wanted to um, project onto the town. Can we close that? And um, we wanted to kind of find real world examples of how this, you know, real, real, real world representations of our kind of like our style, our manifesto almost for this project. And we were looking at kind of old, um, old visions of, um, you know, London especially uh, came into play um, with Leicester Square and so on. Um, and just, just general kind of signs everywhere and, and intensity um, that we were kind of looking at. And again, it was this kind of, we, looked, we paid a special attention to sign, signage in particular because we wanted to change this kind of beautiful old fishing town into kind of like the Las Vegas of Africa. So it was very much about um, designing signs and, um, and kind of buildings as signs. So we were looking at a lot of references like these, obviously. Um, and also kind of some more kind of artistic references. Uh, this is Rita Bella, um, kind of a car 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 cartoon. And also, once we finished the project, we actually, um, once we finished the anim um, artwork, we kind of posted it on our kind of website and, um, you know, we we're advertising it. And we eventually um, got a tweet from someone who says, oh, it really reminds me of, um, of Tech on Kingcrete. And we kind of Googled it and we couldn't believe we'd missed this from our references at the beginning because it was so akin to what we wanted to try and achieve with this kind of visual intensity and kind of buildings made from signs and... It was just a really intense um, um, kind of artwork package that they had for this for this cartoon, but also the film was really amazing. So you should definitely check that out. Um, it's become a quite a good reference for us. But again, uh, looking at kind of spaces, um, what kind of spaces did we want to represent? Because when we started the artwork, we kind of did, we looked at two things. We looked at kind of what kind of we looked at it from a designer, a design point of view, but then we looked at it from a, um, a kind of more of a technical. Um, artistic point of view, um, starting with viewpoint. So we, we were looking at kind of what kind of views we wanted to create, but all, we also worked, looked at what things we wanted to, to design. So a lot of kind of concept artists working in big visual effects studio, they will very much start from composition and they will design in that composition where we, we, we design more like architects from our training in architecture, which is very much starting from a kind of like the outside looking in at a, a product as a, as a design rather than in any particular um, location or, or thing in mind. But we were looking at references at the same time of what we wanted to do. Also, we wanted this, this place to be completely ruined um, through tourism. So we're looking at a lot of references for rubbish. And there were these really interesting kind of like um, uh, pictures that we kind of picked out. But also there was this, there's, this, there's these quite interesting kind of like water traps in, um, in the world, which, kind of which are kind of like these whirlpools of the world's rubbish that kind of swirl around in the oceans. And you get these amazing, um, I haven't actually found any, uh, got any photographs in this presentation, but there are these amazing kind of, um, you know, miles and miles long of um, rubbish which have been collecting in these, in these pools in, in the ocean that you can find. So that was really good references. 
Another underwater was another key aspect. It wasn't just the town that had to change, it was the underwater. So we kind of looked at um, some, you know, the, I looked at these really great um, kind of references for kind of sections through the water, because we already had in mind the idea to, um, to produce images of, of this nature, which were kind of cutting through the water and explaining both worlds from kind of above water and below water. So this was a great reference for that. And again, another one here. Um, and again, the kind of atmosphere and the way that water works, we wanted to kind of research that a little bit before we started um, kind of doing any of the kind of uh, rendering. At, at this point, we had already started modeling and making things. Um, again, so we, 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 do, we start off with the design first rather than the kind of composition. But it was really cool to look at um, just coral references because we wanted to kind of create our own kind of custom coral library, um, which is a bit more maybe fantastical. So these images were really great to kind of like, um, you know, to show the, how, how the light works underwater and that was a great reference for post-production and also kind of composition for, um, for some of the shots. So asset creation. The town, there was nothing too special about the way we created the assets for the town. It was very much just collating this huge library of, um, of kind of work basically. And um, it was kind of, all the, all the kind of assets were generated again from this notion of um, signs and the signs were created through the idea of the town um, being home to the world's biggest fish. So that was kind of like the story arc was, um, was a, a kind of character, our main character was kind of uh, discovered the world's biggest fish in Zanzibar and that kind of sparks this tourist change um, for the town which then over the next 50 years kind of ruins the town and him as an old man is very regret regretful of that. And um, he decides that um, he wants to go out, go and find this this fish uh, when he's an old man and kill it and kill kill what it represents to the town. So that's kind of like the main um, kind of ambition for the story, really. And then our kind of um, our city within that is kind of adds to the character of um, through the film. So these are a whole sequence of kind of assets that were created. Some much more normative. Again, this is there's nothing special about how any of this is generated. It's all just pretty pretty standard um, modeling and um, and texturing just done uh, very painstakingly. Um, we try and find, um, in general, we try and find a, a, a library of free models that we can download at the beginning of a project to show that we're not necessarily modeling everything. I mean, on TurboSquid, you can find hundreds of free models of um, almost everything to varying qualities, obviously, but um, you know, to give ourselves a kind of head start with some of the kind of um, asset building. Some of it was slightly more custom made with, um, with kind of particle effects and things like that. Uh, some of which I'm going to go through um, on the day two, which is more focusing on the animation. Um, but again, there's, there's nothing special about this. It's more just having some fun with, um, with the design of, um, of different signs that we could kind of use. And we also kind of generated this huge library of posters um, that we could kind of like splash out and create a lot of variants in a lot of the kind of scenes that we were creating. And there's, kind of, there's quite a lot of kind of like um, dark comedy within some of these. Um, and we had some fun with um, you know, the message. And I think this is key to building a really, if you're, what we're trying to specialize in to a certain extent is, um, is world building, like designing um, environments and being kind of digital production designers on film and TV. That's kind of where we're trying to aim part of the business. And I think one of the key aspects of creating a successful, believable um, world is, is just the level of detail. Um, it's, it's kind of every little thing adds to the detail of that world and it from kind of small posters, because you, know, you see them very clearly here, but in the film, you'd be, you'd be hard pressed to spot any of these if, unless you were really looking. But it's that kind of like primary, secondary, and tertiary detail in kind of world building, which kind of gives it that very believable um, kind of visual effect, basically. Because I think too often within, um, within cinema, you, you, the production design is very, the digital production design particularly is, um, in, in kind of science fiction films is not as considered necessarily as it is um, in other formats like game design, for example, where it's very, very much considered and the research that goes into those projects is, is, is hugely extensive. So we'll be talking about um, how we kind of generated these rock structures as the kind of first airbrush um, kind of test. Um, so these were kind of generated um, as kind of base shapes in Max brought into ZBrush, textured and painted. And then this is the kind of the final effect through um, you know, through the final images. And again, um, although, you know, you, th this course isn't necessarily 
um, obviously focused on a pure architecture visualization, but all the techniques that are used can be used in architecture visualization. Whether you know when you learn ZBrush and the painting of these rocks, it can easily be applied to uh, landscapes, mountains, you know, and all these kind of things. So, um, although my course isn't specifically focused towards architectural visualization, it, the techniques that I'm um, teaching are hugely relevant um, to all aspects, really. Um, so again, this learning how to kind of create these really rusted forms within um, within Max and ZBrush to kind of produce um, images like this. And, and again, a lot of this looks very um, intense and complicated, but um, some of the techniques I'll show you, you'd be surprised how quick some of these things can come together. And these images were put together for the artwork book, basically, um, to kind of show the ambition that we wanted to try and achieve. So again, this was very much a, a design and visualization task when we were kind of um, abstractly putting together some of these forms um, of boat structures to then um, you know, create these quite elaborate spaces within the film. Well, that was the ambition at the artwork stage anyway. And then we'll be looking at kind of like creating um, using Z spheres, which is a, di a very different kind of modeling technique to anything you might be used to. If you, for those of you who haven't used ZBrush, one or two of you might have start, uh, already used it. But um, so it's again, in look, looking at um, being aware of different techniques for modeling, basically, because it's not always um, just kind of um, one way of doing things um, with kind of poly modeling. There's some very fast techniques where you can generate forms very quickly um, within ZBrush. And we created a whole library of kind of assets here. And also, we're talking a little bit about um, these rubbish piles that we kind of made and how we kind of formed them all kind of um, falling on top of each other. So again, all of this, all of this kind of assets um, kind of formed the kind of base of our kind of images here. And all the kind of coral structures were kind of scattered on, um, on top of our kind of rock structures, just adding again, just a further level of um, detail and, and um, intensity. And then swapping using the same image, but then using the boats and all the rubbish to kind of on the floor, um, using a similar technique but with a different library. And then I'll be talking about the scene setup of the um, rooftop town image, which we'll be looking at a little bit of um, camera projection, um, and then just generally setting up the scene. So you can kind of see here how um, just generating this library of assets then becomes super useful when you start to create the composition of the scene because you can literally just play around and move things very very quickly. So we found that once we had our library, we were able to kind of com uh, compose and produce these images extremely quickly. And uh, this is one of the underwater scenes that I'll be going, at, going through. And then the kind of sectional um, image and how that kind of developed, basically, um, and how this was kind of split into several models using the kind of background image as a, as a base for, composite, uh, for kind of placing the elements. And then just looking at the post-production, um, of, of each of those shots. So we have the underwater image here and how that changed into this from raw render. We have the, um, the kind of poster image which started off as a kind of very quick collage to get the kind of scene composition right. Um, this is a picture of the town. This is just some water. So these are like several images that I've just been, and this is just a bit of painting um, with a kind of image kind of blended in at the bottom just to give a composition and then how that directly informed this because there's nothing of this that actually remains in this it's completely replaced but it was just used as reference for compos composition and then the roof town image which started off as um, quite an interesting um, panorama which is not a real camera view it's kind of three three cameras stitched together and then kind of building the base geometry of that um, and then camera projecting that image back onto that base geometry so we have all the contact shadows and stuff from our um, from our elements that we're putting in here and then I'll be on to, at the end of today, um, if we have time, I'll be going through a few other examples um, on how we develop um, a project um, from an artwork point of view um, with this latest, our latest project, Xavier. So I'll be going through some, some of that. And then day two, what I'll be doing is, um, is mainly focusing on animation. So we'll start off with pre-visualization, which was a huge part of, um, of Jonah. And it will be kind of teaching how simple it is to kind of... Um, have a rigged biped which, or a rigged model that you can you know, buy from the internet and, um, and linking that to, with mocap data. Um, and there's, there's so, many, um, so much mocap data out there to kind of get um, base movements for people. You don't have to know how to character. We, we, we're not character animators. We don't do, you know, do much of that. Uh, one of the guys does a little bit more, but uh, we, we, you know, we focus more on, um, on, the, on this was 
focusing more on the pre-visualization. So it was just getting something really quick, a movement, a general movement, if it's a guy running or a guy dancing or whatever it is, um, and then putting some cameras in and then you can quickly tell a story um, very easily. It's not something that's, um, that's necessarily very complex at all to set this up. And then how that, how that pre-visualization with simple bipeds and simple scene setups really influenced the final product of, of, of the film, basically. So we had this, this film fully pre before we even went to, um, to Zanzibar. I'll be talking a little bit about tracking um, and how we kind of tracked this elaborate street shot um, using PF track. And then I'll be talking about lots of different kind of animation techniques that we use within the film, really. Um, mainly focus on the, on the transformation of the town. So I'll be looking at um, the slice rotation, um, which is a very, very simple but effective technique uh, that we use quite a lot for, for animations. And you'll see one or two of these techniques popping up in arch architectural visualization animations all over the place. Um, and how that uh, directly influenced some of the you know, visual effects in the rooftops here. I'll be talking a little bit about just manual constraints and how that works um, through, through animation. Um, when we, this is a kind of animated sign that kind of folds out of nothing, and I'll be teaching a little bit of that. And again, how that kind of um, goes into the main scene here. I'll be introducing you to kind of the ray fire basics and talking about how we created this kind of reverse wall fracture, um, which kind of started off as this kind of piled crumble in that shot and then ended up as this kind of like built kind of fish tavern. You can see that um, within that shot there. And how yeah, we've used that in several different uh, projects in the past. Um, there's this really cool technique um, in using P-Flow. So we'll be, looking, we'll be looking at the P-Flow basics, but then looking really um, actually getting quite complex within P-Flow within this one. And the, this will probably be one of the scene files that will actually give you um, um, on top of this. And this is essentially, um, it's quite, you can't really tell from here, but I'll show, a little, um, I'll show a little animation in a second that shows you some of these kind of transformation techniques. Um, and this is essentially this kind of particle effect that kind of emerges from nowhere. Um, introducing you to the basics of thinking particles and looking at how we um, create these kind of like, again, particle effects, which kind of uh, come from objects. Um, our objects appearing out of nowhere and how that was used um, specifically in our Golden Age film. Um, and then in, again, mass effects basics. So again, simulation, something people are you know, a bit wary of or not, not sure how to use, but again, it's very, very simple. Um, you can create very simple effects like you know, dropping objects, placing scenes more naturally, uh, placing objects more naturally within scenes um, and became really useful obviously for dropping and creating kind of piles of, um, of rubbish, which would have been a complete nightmare to do, to do manually and would have never looked quite as convincing. R randomness is very difficult to achieve digitally. Um, we're looking at a kind of base setup for um, how we created this um, cart animation, not, not, in the kind of, um, not in the vehicle itself, but in the kind of simulation of the, um, of the elements within the cart. And then day three, um, we'll focus more on rendering and compositing. And this is going to look at um, Going through the basics of um, rendering a fly-through, um, which some people know, but it's just it's amazing how um, many times we see people not know how to render animations properly with different settings. Uh, there's fly-through animations, the most basic one. Rendering moving objects in a simple scene. Um, there's a few tips and tricks that we can show which don't necessarily require uh, everything to be pre-calc or and, and avoid using brute force. There's there's a complete there's a much much simpler way of um, doing simple moving object scenes. For example, uh, typically in architecture visualization, you might have you know, a chalk animation with some moving people or some moving cars. And it's those scenes in particular where this technique can come in really, really useful. And then rendering full on moving complex scenes, um, which is again, uh, learning the pre-calc workflow properly. And then looking at a very specific example, again, going back to the street scene, um, how that was set up uh, with rendering this kind of like fish bar. Um, and then how those elements are composited within Nuke. What um, this is this day is going to focus largely on Nuke, and this is going to be kind of teaching you the workflow from Max to Nuke. Some plugins that are really good between those two softwares, and um, what elements you need to kind of rebuild um, your kind of composite, and then uh, what elements are used um, for other other purposes. Um, <clears throat> so rebuilding your RGB. This will be focusing on a kind of. Um, taking one element and, and um, really working that in and seeing how we did that. And then Nuke Advanced, we'll spend the rest of the day 
Um, just going through some of the more advanced features of Nuke so you feel really comfortable. Because Nuke is one of those things which looks really complicated, but when, as soon as you break through a very small barrier, it becomes um, pretty amazing and, and, it, and it will replace your composite workflow completely. You will, you'll never use After Effects again. So um, that's the kind of course outline for the next three days. So what we're going to start with is just having a peek at some of the kind of asset creation for the town. Again, I'm not really going to go into huge detail with this because there's nothing hugely complicated in the way that it, in the way that it worked. So I'll just be opening up a model and just showing you some of the some of the actual assets here, and then we'll kind of move into um, some of the more um, introducing you to ZBrush, basically. So. <clears throat> Let's open a new Max. Okay, let's make this not full screen so it doesn't crop on our window. There we go. recent projects. <clears throat> so again, I think this, this workflow of kind of designing assets first is slightly different to how most other studios might work or most um, certainly in kind of visual effects, how, how they would work. It's more, uh, more like how we would start an architectural um, project, starting with the design first and then the, um, the image separately. So it's more of a kind of design list than a, um, than a kind of image list. We didn't really start with an image list. We didn't really have like a tick, a tick box of, um, of images we wanted. We wanted to create kind of like a package. And this package was to inform um, the development of the project. The, the package was made to, um, to kind of generate more money and get people more excited um, with the project, basically. And it also gave um, everyone a kind of more of a visual um, a visual um, reference to what the project was about. We were talking about the town being very, um, uh, you know, we were talking about the town looking in a certain way, but no one could quite get it. No one could quite get what we were talking about with the, um, with the signs. We needed to do things very specifically. It sounds very kind of odd, this town based on um, kind of fish signs and things like that. But, it, but uh, well, as soon as we kind of created the artwork, everyone was kind of on board. So again, all of this was just um, very basic um, modeling and, and texturing. A lot of the kind of time to save time, we wouldn't even unwrap things. We we just like this guy here. We might we might kind of look at him from the front viewport um, of of the kind of isolated um, shape of this fish. We might even just print screen or or kind of screen capture this and then use that in Photoshop to. Um, to kind of map and then map it, map it straight on. You don't have to necessarily unwrap everything. Um, there's kind of quicker workflows to just when you have to do these things. You know, we, the, the, this wasn't really for, um, you know, a game designer or anything like that. Nothing had to be, um, you know, done in really kind of optimized ways. It was very much, this is just for the artwork and we're going to um, just do things very quickly, basically. So, you, you know, you'll see that we haven't spent any time on um, edging or things like that. It's, it's you know, getting the textures to wrap around or anything super specific. Everything's just mapped with box mapping um, and things like that. There's nothing too special about any of the kind of neon signs. They were all just um, made with um, light materials. They might have a fall off um, so that the light looks slightly different when you look at it from straight and that the color might come more on the, on the edges. Uh, but there was nothing super specifically complicated about any of the um, content. Um, some of the models had, had kind of lights within, within, within them. Um, that's not something we normally practice. We normally kind of um, have all the lights within the camera files. But um, for, for, this, for the sake of this, we because this was so specific and so complicated and we wanted to um, copy these models around, it was easier to put them in the, in the actual model files themselves. And as long as they're exposed roughly to what our camera was, which is always around F8 for exterior scenes, then it was, then it was going to be we knew it was going to work fine, basically. Um, so yeah, some of these models. I'll just kind of run through some of them. So yeah, we, we, at this stage, we didn't have any of the final artwork because uh, in, the, in the actual film, a lot of the kind of images we had on the billboards were of our main character uh, once we had shot it, um, of him with the fish. 
Um, just loads of um, just kind of trusses and fences and things were made. Um, and little kind of fish hanging from, um, you know, hangers. And a lot of this was then taken directly and animated later on. Um, loads of fish signs, some 3D fish signs. I think we downloaded this guy um, and then kind of um, edited him a little bit. So it's been, being really fast with the assets, but making them, you know, good enough, basically. Yeah, we had lots of... Um, yeah, we made lots of kind of neon signs and we spent a little bit of time developing the kind of um, materials for these things, but not, not, not again, not huge. I think this was our first kind of mock-up of, um, this was actually our actor, and this is, this is the kind of mock-up of the, of the picture of the fish jumping out the water behind him. And again, lots of kind of like um, little houses and things like that, which were not made in a huge amount of detail like the you know the mapping and things like that because we, we were never we we're never rendering here like this you know we, we were rendering you know all the way way back here so again it's just being clever and fast with your workflow depending on what the project is for again some of the signs become a bit more obvious more big fish loads more signs And then we started creating kind of like, once we had a, a bit more of a library, we started creating these kind of like big towers, which would be kind of feature in the sea. We wanted to kind of poke out. So kind of advertising is everywhere. It's kind of like it's extended out from the town and it's actually kind of poking out from the water. So we created these kind of like, you know, kind of like um, structures on legs that would kind of be coming out of the water. So these are, these are actually all the assets from that rooftop scene. And they're kind of, um, we didn't really know um, what assets we were going to use in any, in any one scene particularly. Um, we know we wanted a two-level um, kind of system to, to the artwork. We wanted the kind of like, as it's changing, is all, is all, these, kind of, um, all these kind of models. And then in the future, when he's an old man, we, we have slightly more extravagant models with all of the holograms and things like that. You know, crab neon signs and just having some fun, really. It was, it was quite a fun stage. We were just kind of like using lots of referencing and then just ma making lots and lots of models and having some fun with the design. Sea King, the Burger King and so on. So again, there's actually quite a lot of repetition if you look at it, um, with some, especially with some of the signs. But um, you don't really read that in, in, the, um, in the scene when you kind of composite all of these things. And again, these models were slightly different. These were using um, kind of Krakatoa and Frost to generate um, kind of particle effects, basically. And these were kind of animated and moving. Um, this little guy was kind of um, on, on constraints and we had a wind um, underneath him. You can see there's kind of a fan there and this was kind of blowing him. So he was kind of a, a big blimp. Um, but again, um, I wanted to kind of touch on it, but I didn't want to go into too much detail just because um, I want to focus on some other areas. But if, if there was any questions about how about any of any of this, it's probably best to talk about that now, really, before we move on to some of the more organic elements within ZBrush. So were there any questions with the kind of asset creation of the town? Okay, we have one question. Oh, just quickly, it looks really cool. Um, did you go in and bake any of the materials, or and how did you, did you go in to I mean, diffuse reflection and stuff like that? You said you dive fairly deep into it, but not too deep. Um, I mean, each each material would have a diffuse reflection um, specularity and things like that. So if we just generate those maps from um, the base diffuse from any of the textures we found or made. Basically, we made a, a big library of specifically for um, the kind of buildings down here. We created a big library of um, of kind of materials that we could use to add a bit more variance. I mean, you can see that this one actually repeats here, which is probably less, 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 um, less good. But uh, again, for the for the kind of scale that we were working at, it was it was perfectly fine. But yeah, we did generate um, specularity and reflection maps for all for all of the all of the mapping. It wasn't just purely flat flat mapping. But we didn't bake anything using render to texture or anything like that, um, which is obvious. You use a lot in game design. Uh, we don't. We've done a little bit of that in the past, but um, we were lighting everything within the scene. Um, Kind of as you would normally in an architectural project. So, any normal mapping, or are you just 
straight bump mapping work? Um, yeah, no, we, we, we played, we actually did play with a few um, different kind of plugins that we were in Photoshop, which generated all of your kind of bump and specularity maps. But uh, we just found that that workflow was a bit messy for us with this project. And we didn't, we didn't um, go that, that, that in depth with it, basically. So it was just standard bump mapping for all of the city elements, basically. We, in the, you'll see from the, um, in the kind of ZBrush workflow, some of the, some of the assets we generated with that were um, using normal maps for the, the bump mapping and things. But for the city, um, the city was all pretty standard mapping techniques, basically. And again, a lot of the time, we would just, um, you know, it's, it's a really, um, I would say, unprofessional workflow, um, but it works, it is to um, just simply print screen um, a lot of the kind of faces we were looking at and then mapping that um, very specifically. And for us, it's just, it's just really quick. You know, it's, it's, just, it's just really quick to kind of take this, this model here with these kind of like, wind, you know, openings print screen that as large as we can from the side, blow that up in Photoshop and then create a map. Um, you know, within, within you know, five minutes, you've got a good map, um, which is mapped perfectly. And you can get all the kind of texture near the edges of the windows and, and, and be very specific very quickly. Whereas if I know um, in the new um, Max, is the, and, we, and we do unwrap when we have time and we, and we, um, we you know, the, the object merits, merits it. But when, when you're being quick with simple objects, it's really, um, and I'm sure, um, the people at uh, the bigger visual effects houses kind of cheat sometimes and do stuff like that. Uh, it's just the way that we find working very quickly with mapping things um, that isn't just a kind of standard texture. Because I mean, we've done, we do all sorts of things with um, uh, using kind of inverse dirt textures to create, um, you know, different textures on the edges of objects, which you can then apply noise to to create more variance. We've done stuff like that um, with other projects specifically for some of the more spa the space projects that we've just done. Um, we did a lot of that technique. For, um, but for this kind of simple hard surface stuff, it was just easy to um, print screen and do it in Photoshop, basically. So were there any more other questions about any of the assets created for the kind of city areas? Anything online, Jeff? Cool. OK. So. First thing we're going to look at is um, is kind of introducing you to the kind of ZBrush workflow. So we'll go into I'll just show you the basics of kind of the ZBrush interface, and then we'll kind of look at three specific examples of how we used it. Again, with the rocks, um, with the boats, and then with the corals, basically. Um, and they, they they all three use ZBrush in very very different ways. Um, you'll see kind of people doing rocks. Rocks is like the classic thing to do when you're learning ZBrush. Basically, it's fun. And it's, um, it's just, yeah, it's, it's really nice um, kind of small thing to do when you're kind of getting used to the, the everything to do with ZBrush from um, modeling, sculpting, and, um, and texturing, and then kind of re-exporting um, to Max. So the, um, let's have a look at this. This is kind of how we started some of the rock models, basically. So we'd start off with some very basic forms in, um, in Max. And you can, you could, we could have done this in ZBrush. We could, we could have started this with ZBrush in a very different workflow, more, more in the same workflow that we um, started the um, the coral stuff. But for this project, for, the, for this element, it was kind of nicer to just play around with some edit poly um, and actually just kind of get get the raw kind of shape as as we wanted it. Um, and some of the rocks were very, you know, more sim simpler kind of shape, um, you know, larger elements, and some of them were a lot more kind of um, a lot more complex, basically. And I think one of the reasons why we did do this in Max rather than starting in ZBrush um, is because we wanted these kind of closed loopholes in, um, in a lot of the designs. And um, that proved a little bit more tricky to do in, um, in using the Z-spheres, which we were planning on using for this project. So it was much easier just to kind of get in there with some edit poly and just quickly um, getting some shapes. And uh, not all of the shapes kind of made it in. We, I think the original file for this we had you know, maybe 20 different iterations of some, of some shapes that we were playing with. Um, <clears throat> again, nothing particularly special about how this is made. It's just edit poly. Um, and then turbo smooth. And then that gives us our base mesh um, to bring into ZBrush. It doesn't really matter um, the resolution of this at this stage, to be honest, because um, ZBrush works in kind of poly, in, um, in polygons, and it kind of paints with polygons. Um, 
but you generate the resolution of those things in, in ZBrush later on, and I'll, I'll explain how that, how that kind of works. But um, so yeah, let's take this guy here, and let's, um, let's bring him into ZBrush. So when you install ZBrush, um, you have this little guy here called GoZ, and this is this is your kind of this used to be a, an extended plugin to ZBrush, but it's for quite a few years it's been integrated um, into the workflow of ZBrush. And once you press this, um, you'll get Edit in ZBrush option there. But before you do that, you always want to place your model on zero zero zero. Um, you'll never really compose your scene and then bring elements into ZBrush. You'll always generate assets separately and then um, work on it once it's complete. So let's move this guy to 0, 0, 0 in the, in the, in the viewport. That puts him there. Let's leave the turbo to move on. I um, can't remember if you have to actually collapse this or not, but I'm going to collapse it anyway, um, just in case. There's no real need while we need any of that other data anymore. We could copy this object and put him on a separate layer if you wanted to keep any of that. Um, so let's just press Go Z now and see what happens, and then we'll um, introduce you to some of the kind of ZBrush workflow. So instantly, it opens up ZBrush, and it will kind of load our tool there, and it will come up with all these menus of preset projects and things that you can play with. But we just want to hide that. So ZBrush kind of works in uh, three main areas. You kind of have um, your kind of painting and sculpting tools here on the left and you can um, and then you have all of your kind of um, loading and geometry tools and UV mapping and everything else over here um, most menus you can access from the top as well I'll just go out of full screen so you can actually see everything um, for those of you in the class let's, um, okay so the first thing we want to do is um, just click on our tool. So our tool is already selected there. And if we click and drag in the viewport, you can, we can kind of see that we're kind of dragging him in. And it doesn't really matter how big this is or where he's positioned. Um, this positioning that you're doing here has got nothing to do with the, the, the global position of this object in relation to Max. He will always remain on zero, zero, zero. So let's just click and drag now. And what you'll notice is that um, if you click and drag again, you've got something weird happening. You're actually working in 2.5D mode. So you can just keep clicking and dragging, and you're wondering what's going on, and it's all quite confusing. How do I rotate around this model? Um, what you need to do is um, reset this document now, because you've made a mess. So you just go to Document. Um, uh, I think it's Control-N, I think is the shortcut. Control-N is New, New Document. Um, and let's do that again. Let's bring him in once. <clears throat> so what you have to do is you have to um, make him a 3D object. At the moment, he's not a 3D object, believe it or not. He's 2.5D. So ZBrush has this um, weird function of being able to work um, on a kind of paint painting. Um, not painting a 3D object, but painting a 2D viewport. Um, and that's, that's used for lots of different purposes, but we've never really used it properly. Um, we've never really had a function or a project where we needed to use 2.5D ZBrush, and, we, and um, I can't really see how we ever would, to be honest. Um, I've seen some people use it for interesting ways, but um, um, and if you're interested, do some research on 2D ZBrush, but um, for me, I, I only use it for painting and sculpting. So to make him a, um, a 3D object, we have to go up here and choose Edit, Edit Object. Now we're in th a 3D model, and we can actually rotate around this guy. And you'll notice when you first use ZBrush that it's got this weird um, kind of rotation system, which is not like 3D Max. Um, and what you have to do is that's just over here you have your controls in your viewport, basically. And if we just click on this, you can see the rotate on all axis is, is, is um, selected. To make it like Max, you just have to click rotate on Y axis, and that will allow you to um, rotate as, you, as it would feel in, um, in 3D Max. So, Again, you can, they, they have um, sh buttons here for scrolling, for zooming, um, and things like that. But the, um, these are all kind of accessible within the, um, within the mouse and keyboard. You can use the left button. Um, the left button is rotate. If you hold down Alt and left button, it pans. And it's just getting used to all the shortcuts, really. 
Um, the only f slightly funny one is the zoom. If you're kind of if you're kind of panning and then you let go of um, of Alt, then it zooms and it feels very unnatural at first, but you'll get you'll get used to it. If I'm moving around, zooming, rotating, panning. It's just Alt and left click is is all of the function for that really. Um, <clears throat> So within those two buttons, you'll be able to pretty much navigate around your model very easily. Um, just a little note about the, um, the zooming. You'll notice that if I zoom, this is, this is the, a visual representation of my model, which is now very pixelated. Um, because you're actually zooming the canvas. You're not zooming into the model. And you can see our canvas here. And then once you, once you go to slightly full screen, you'll notice this extra... Um, Kind of window here, and if we actually, um, if we, if we sometimes we get trapped in our model where we're actually, um, you can see here when I'm zooming um, using the Alt function and the left click, we, we our model doesn't lose resolution. It, it it's just zooming into that model basically. So the, we're not zooming into the canvas, we're zooming into the model. But let's say we get trapped and we're actually um, our model fills the screen. And now, when we rotate, oh, we can't. We're actually sculpting instead. Um, so that's what this window is here for. It's like a safe frame outside your model, which you can then always rotate from. So if you ever get stuck inside your model, you can always rotate out of it. So again, a lot of these functions are pretty obvious. Um, we can kind of see our resolution of our mesh with poly, poly free, um, polyframe. Um, we can see transparency, and that comes in later on. Um, I'll show you what that means later on. Um, we can isolate elements um, or isolate selections. Uh, yeah, so all this is all this is relatively obvious. So again, um, before we go into any kind of detail where anything else is, um, to save your scene, um, you need to save as up here. And what this is doing, this, 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 there's different methods of saving ZBrush. Um, so the, the first method is saving the tool. Um, so let's save this guy in rocks here. Let's call him CG school one. So we're saving the, the um, Z tool, Z tool here. And what that does is, um, if we kind of close down ZBrush and open it again. Okay, we're, you know, we haven't got our tool in here. Um, so what we have to do is we have to load the tool. And it hasn't brought it into the canvas. We've just loaded the tool here and we have to click and drag him back in again. And we have to click edit again. That's the way that tools work. And it, again, you haven't moved that tool when you've dragged that in. It's, 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 already, it's still in the same location, um, but that's how the kind of tools work. And that's fine if you're working on one object at a time or, um, or you're working very quickly, for example. Um, but what I tend to do if I've got lots of different things going on is I um, basically save as from file here. And what, that, what this does, it saves the ZPR, the, the ZBrush project. So that will just save your project um, as it exists here with all the materials, with all of the... Um, you know, sub tools and things like that, and it will save it within the viewport. So if we save this again, see the score one. We've saved that now. And if we close ZBrush and open them again, luckily it's quite fast. Then uh, we can go to file open, and we and what that does, it will kind of load all the tools that you have within that file, basically. So you might you might be working with more than one tool in a file. That's kind of how you work. ZBrush project. So now we've loaded this within our canvas, and it's all here for waiting for us, basically. Which is useful. Again, turn on our Y. Can't really work without the what that on. Um, so let's look at what we can do in here. So again, this is painting and sculpting. So we can select our brushes here. There's millions of different brushes that you can, you can download all different ones. Um, there's different ways that you can apply your, um, 
your kind of stroke, whether it's kind of a, a drag or whether it's a freehand spraying, uh, loads of different ways. You can load textures or use um, inbuilt textures and you can kind of mask that texture in certain ways to give you different effects. So that, that all operates here. You can change your, just your base material. Um, sometimes um, it's fine. To, this, this kind of, this is this classic ZBrush material that you'll see everywhere on pictures and stuff um, on the internet, um, which is fine for kind of sculpting, um, but it's not great for texturing. On texturing, you want to turn on like a chalk material um, so that you can kind of work with a, more of a, a, a good base to work with. Because if you're texturing on top of on top of this, then you'll kind of see the color of that coming through. Um, and again, there's all different kind of presets that are, are good for certain kinds of things, um, really shiny ones. And ZBrush has got an amazing um, user a kind of like viewport um, speed. Even when these models get to billions of polygons, they um, the viewport speed in ZBrush is amazing. Um, Again, so have fun with trying to see which one's good for what you're doing at that time. Um, I'll stick with the, uh, the red one for now. And, okay, so let's look at some of these things. Um, low tool, import, export. Le um, this import, export function is more for um, other file formats like um, OBJs. You can just, if your Go Z for some reason isn't working or, or anything like that, um, it's more for bringing in, um, you know, in Mac saving out an OBJ and then bringing that in uh, specifically. Um, I tell, I've actually never used that because Go Z has always, always um, been there since I've been using ZBrush and it's always the better, the better way of bringing models in and out of ZBrush. Um, just out of interest, um, if, if, I, um, if I press Go Z now, this will load Max and it will um, bring this object back into Max. But um, I'll, ex I'll talk a bit more about that later on. So let's open the geometry, geometry toolbar. We'll skip Subtool for now because Subtool is essentially just listing the the, the, um, the all of the objects we have within our model um, and we can work on them separately. And so they'll appear here and you'll just click on each one if you want to work on, on them and you can have them uh, visible or not visible um, only when you've got more than one in, in your scene. Uh, geometry, this is where essentially you'll control the resolution of your geometry um, and all different other uh, um, things that you can do. So let's look at this uh, resolution at the moment. We can see that it's like this. And all you have to do to add more geometry is divide, right? And the, the, the shortcut for that is D. Um, so we can see here, if we divide this, so the resolution is not these lines here. You can actually see that it's um, much, much smoother now. So you can see when we um, go down our resolutions, we can see what we're doing. And the way this works is that whenever you export your ZBrush model after you've finished painting and sculpting and things, it will export the lowest resolution um, mesh that you've got. And then it'll, um, the way it works is it generates a displacement map which has all of this extra detail information um, within it, which then you can bring back into and use a V-Ray v -ray displacement modifier and, um, and bring back all of that detail. So you can kind of always work at a kind of, uh, always have your model at a relatively decent resolution. Um, I mean, I think for the purpose of this model, our, lo our lowest subdiv might want to be higher than this. Um, you can see the, um, the, the amount of points in your model up here. So the active points is what we have displayed in our viewport right now. The total points is our highest level of subdivision. So you can see now they're the same. And when I bring that down, there like this. So this is only 8,000 polygons, which is a very, very small model. But our, our displacement information when we export that will have 135,000 polygons, basically. Um, and there's a rule of thumb um, for some of these rock models, which were huge in their resolution. Um, I think the highest level of active points I exported on the lowest level was about um, just under a million, basically. So on some of these models, I take the lowest subdiv to almost a million or, or maybe 500,000. Um, and then the total number of points which will be exported in, in, um, can go up to billions. ZBrush, um, ZBrush works very intuitively with very high resolution meshes. And you can, um, you can work in HD geometry, which I'll show you later on, which, which, takes, um, which is about, oh, I came out a couple of years ago in ZBrush and um, enables you to create very, very high resolution textures and, um, um, and models. Because the way that ZBrush works is that you're, you're, when you paint, you, you're painting onto the, onto the polygon. It's polygon painting technology. So 
We've, we've made our model a higher subdiv, but we might not necessarily want to start in that way. We might not, not want to want to just um, up, up the subdivs. What I tend to do, um, I think the lowest level of subdiv is a bit too low for working at a base level. So let's let's um, put him on two, and then we can press delete lower. And what that's going to do, it's going to bake in that resolution to our lowest to our lowest point of our mesh, basically. So um, before we um, start to really sculpt anything here. Um, when you're working at a base level, this isn't, this isn't necessarily the final shape that I want to work with. This is the shape that I've started in Max, but maybe I want to kind of alter this shape quite drastically before I start adding detail. And while you're working in the raw form, the raw kind of like overall shape of something, you should always work in, um, in, um, where is it gone? Let's have a look. In Dynamesh mode, basically. And DynaMesh mode is again quite new to ZBrush, relatively speaking. Um, but what it does is it retopologizes your mesh um, whenever you want. So let's make some extreme adjustments here, and then you can also, you can see what I'm you see what I'm saying. When making extreme ad adjustments, there's a quite a cool little tool um, called the Snake Hook tool. And just to talk a bit about our brushes before we start anything here, same as in Photoshop. The, um, the kind of bracket keys control the size of your brush. So we can see our little arrow key getting bigger here now. And then you'll see here RGB and Z add. It's relatively simple, these, these kind of one, two, three, four, five, six functions here. RGB is painting. So we're not painting at the moment, so we can turn that off. Z add is sculpting or Z sub. You know. By default, um, let's, uh, let's have a look at this for a second. Uh, so one second. By default, when you press Alt, it inverts so that you, um, when you click and drag this, it clicks, it, it kind of drags it out. But when you click, kind of um, press Alt, it kind of inverts that basically. And then you can see that we have two little um, symbols. One is essentially the, the it's the it's the, um, the focal shift. It's the fall off. So you can see what we're doing here. That circle in the middle is getting smaller. So now, when there's zero fall off, we're moving 100% of that selection. Um, whereas when we like this, we're moving more of a feathered selection, basically. So anyway, let's go. That, so that's the, that's the kind of like um, the drawing tools and how we, how we use that. And then the, the Z add, we can change the intensity of that there. So we can kind of like adjust how, how that's working. That's not working very much. And that's working a lot. Um, so again, depends on what you're doing. Sometimes you might want to have that lower. Sometimes you might want to have it on 100%. And that works the, the same way with um, the RGB when you're painting. You have an intensity here, opacity. So it's very simple to kind of create um, brushes and knowing what you're doing with, with um, painting and texturing. Now you're not doing anything. Both of these things are deselected. So let's make, a, let's make a, a drastic adjustment to this model and then I'll show you how the DynaMesh works. So you can see here that this has um, kind of extruded those polygons, just like if you were soft selecting something in Max and you're kind of pulling them out. Now what DynaMesh does, when you press this, um, see what it's going to do, if you've got more than one subdivision level, it's going to warn you um, to, to freeze the subdivision level before you start. Um, so you want to make sure that you're at the lower subdivision level before pressing this, and then just press yes. And then what, what this is going to do, it's going to kind of like, um, when you go into DynaMesh mode here, It's going to retopologize. It doesn't look like it because we made such an extreme adjustment, but it's going to retopologize this in an even way, and that's really good when you're like sculpting really base blocky stuff. So if we take our kind of like uh, good good kind of tool as a kind of clay build up for kind of building a mass of areas and things like that. So if we um, adjust our focal shift a little bit, we just start building mass around our model in certain areas. And this is really fun with a pen. Uh, I've got a mouse here, but um, once you start messing around with things with a pen, you can see um, we might want to change this to be a slightly more color spray. We might want to adjust our um, our size a little bit so we get more of a kind of like crumpled effect with our buildup. So at this point, we might just be building mass. So we want we want this bit bigger here, right? So we're kind of building mass. But you see, the more we do this, we, the more we're stretching out the pixels of our of our model. So we always have to um, work in Dynamesh. So we click on Dynamesh again. And you can see it retopologizes everything. 
What we have to be careful of, we can see that we're already now working at a base level of 778,000 um, polygons. So um, you want to kind of regenerate your Dynamesh at a lower resolution. So let's try something a bit lower and click Dynamesh again. This little progress bar at the top will show you um, it working. Um, I'm going to go back slightly so that we can regenerate this Dynamesh. Uh, that's the one thing you really want to um, make sure that you don't do is generate the Dynamesh too high because then you won't be able to go back. So we're back at a sensible level now. Um, let's move this Dynamesh. It's a bit too sensitive for my liking, this um, resolution parameter. Um, okay, so now we're working in Dynamesh at 26,000, so it's, it's kind of a, a rough base model, but getting your overall form at this, at this, at this kind of stage makes a lot of sense. Um, rather than kind of wasting time on any details, you're just literally blocking in the kind of main shapes, basically the main kind of areas that you want to be um, that you're, when, you, when you're still designing your shape or your object. So you make, a, you make a few adjustments and then a quick shortcut while in Dynamesh mode is press control and drag and then that will automatically um, re redistribute your Dynamesh. You don't have to keep pressing this and pressing it again and in and out. You can just kind of keep sculpting, press um, out of the model control uh, and, dra and drag and then you're instantly kind of like back in and you can kind of like do this. Um, when you press shift in ZBrush, it automatically smooths things. So that's a good little one. You always essentially use um, uh, alt for kind of pushing in, normal for pushing out, and then um, shift for smoothing. And with those, with those three buttons, you can pretty much start sculpting whatever you want um, and kind of generate your base form. So we might want to go in a little bit higher resolution for our Dynamesh. Um, 148,000, that makes a bit more sense, I think, for the base level. Um, probably want to turn our Z intensity down a little bit. Um, so essentially, when you're kind of sketching in, there's a few brushes that um, are good to use. There's the, norm the normal default one is the standard tool, and that's just going to give you up and down movements in, in certain areas, basically. And you can kind of like, you know, at this stage, you can go into as much detail as you really want. You know, you can start to, um, you know, push in creases in certain areas and, um, you know, and generate your kind of overall shape. What I tend to do when I was making these rocks is kind of like, draw where I want the rocks, literally, so you know, this is a rock there, it's kind of a boulder within that shape, um, you know, this is a rock here, and I'm just using the Alt key to kind of draw into it, really, um, but you really start defining where these things are, and then from there you can kind of start adding your detail and making elements more bulbous or sticking out, or, you know, you can really start to, okay, here I want this kind of connection here to be a lot more harsh, so I want to push this element right in here, I'll turn my Z intensity up. It's really kind of carve this bit out. So it's kind of like hanging on like a like a knuckle. So you'll kind of like draw in your base kind of shape. Turn that down a bit too much. So say, let's just for the sake of argument, continue from here um, and not do the rest of it. Say I'm happy with my overall shape. I've gone not, not gone into detail at all at the moment, but this that's fine. So I'm, I'm not going to kind of make any areas more bulbous or significantly different. Then you can kind of like get out of Dynamesh. And that's when you can kind of start dividing your model um, to start working on it in more detail, basically. So Dynamesh is great for kind of blocking out the main shape. And you, you can make this you could make this as extreme as you want. You can you can kind of make uh, you don't you're not restricted by your initial um, mesh that you've generated from Max. Max is just a starting point for kind of like um, building these things. 
Um, and it's important to know that just, just to keep re retopologizing um, your model when in Dynamesh so that you're always having a consistent resolution across the model. Because what, you what you'll do um, if you didn't do that is that when you start to then later on start texturing things, um, you'll notice that some areas of your model are actually higher resolution than others in, 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 in the actual texture of it because you're painting on top of these polygons. That's how it works. So it's good to notice as well. Um, so we're happy with our base form. That's on, that's on essentially layer zero. But just to introduce you to the layers, uh, it works in the, exactly how you would expect layers to work, but it has some very cool features. So um, just like in Photoshop. So in layers, let's work on a new layer now. So untitled layer one. We can name this if we want. Um, can we rename this? Untitled layer. Okay. Um, but um, so if I start working now on this layer, say with a different brush, um, again, you don't want to be adding too much detail yet um, because fine details you really want to make when you're um, uh, at a hot, much, much higher resolution or subdivision level. Um, so let's, keep, let's just keep playing around with the, um, the kind of standard brush or, um, yeah, standard brush. We've got standard brush activated, so you'll be able to see what I'm doing here. So if, if I start adding some details to things, let's make this brush bigger and turn our intensity down a little bit. Um, let's, use, let's use a spray. If I start adding some kind of general, um, I've got my uh, the dots. One second. Oh, my layer. Give me one second. Why is this not working? Local. On. Let me just give me one second. <coughs> yeah. Okay. Schoolboy error there. Um, yeah. It's funny when you lose track of these little guys up here. Yeah. You see there. It's just too low to see them. So we're working on our layer. Um, and if we start making some adjustments here to the shape. then what this is going to do is it's all going to be on this layer here. So we can turn that, um, we can turn the intensity. Where's this working? Okay. One second. What are we painting on that layer? Give me one second here. Figure out what's going on. I think because we're on layer zero, um, this is essentially everything that we have in our model. So if we add a new layer, Let me do that there. Yeah, so we have to essentially create more than one layer because um, essentially everything you're doing will automatically be on layer zero. So working on this layer here um, and sculpting, um, we can see that we can then alter the kind of intensity of that layer, which is really good because we can start working on different levels of detail and working on in different layers. Um, so this might be one adjustment layer, and we'll create another one, and we'll start adding some kind of finer details using the uh, crumple brush, or um, yeah, we might be working at a higher, higher subdivision level, and we add some crumples in here, and then on that layer, we can kind of increase or decrease the effect of that. It's really useful because you can just you know, really organize your kind of sculpting in a, in a way which um, is much more um, controllable. So you can always kind of go back um, and kind of like, um, yeah, turn layers on and off and see how they're affecting things, um, apart from the main layer, which you can't adjust. Uh, and then, yeah, just, just um, making sure you're renaming your layers but uh, getting in the habit of kind of that base workflow really quickly when you're sculpting. Um, so the Dynamesh at the beginning um, and then working with layers for your extra detail later on, basically. Um, <clears throat> so that's layers. And then 
again, we're only working in half a million polygons here. Let's see how far we can push this and what we can do with the, um, the detail levels. So if we keep dividing this, you'll notice that this is now um, 2.3 million. We divide it again, it's 9 million. Yeah. See, this is when we start getting a message which is saying, subdividing the current mesh will produce a mesh with polygons count larger than specified in the preferences memory options. So what that's going to do is we can change that in our preferences, but we don't want to kind of, um, it depends what system we've got. This is quite a good system we're working on here. Um, but generally, when we get up to kind of 10 million in our kind of highest level of subdivision, um, you want to start working in HD after that because it's a much more kind of memory efficient workflow. If you're taking this to kind of 20 million plus in your viewport um, for the whole model, um, you, it can, you can have kind of large loading times and um, it's just better to work with kind of under, under 10 million at your kind of base mesh level, or your highest mesh level, and then work in HD after that. But just an idea of the, you know, the level of um, fine detail that we're kind of being able to sculpt in here now. Um, we can kind of take uh, yeah, one of the standard tool, standard brushes. Um, might want to give it a texture. Again, just pl play around with these things and see how, how they work. Um, might want to alpha that out. Or even if we don't use a texture, or we just use an alpha, and then we can click and drag that on with this tool here. So we've used the spray and the freehand and the dots, but with the click and drag, um, the direct drag tool, you're kind of clicking and you're dragging a texture on. I mean, that's pretty extreme. Um, you can see the resolution that we're working in there now. Okay, what if that's not enough? I mean, I wasn't rendering my rocks there. I was rendering my rocks, um, you know, this level. Um, so it depends what your, your, your thing is for. Just a note as well, I mean, just kind of um, probably a mistake on my part when we first did this project was um, some of the rocks, like the ones in ZBrush here, Specifically this one. Um, this one was one of our hero rocks um, and is very complicated. Um, and he, he, he basically, there's a lot of surface area for this, um, for this model. And what's, how ZBrush works, it has a maximum texture capacity of 8K, right? So um, you've got to think that your model, the texture that covers that model um, is 8,000 is 8, pixels across. So there's only a certain amount of resolution, even if your model is super high resolution in ZBrush. Because what, 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 what we found is that we create these beautiful model, models in here, like ultra realistic details. And then when you bring it back into Max, the displacement would never quite bring it back at that same level of detail. And it was always why. And it's ju it was just because the map that you generate from ZBrush, although it's 8K, which seems quite large, I still think they should have the ability to go larger than that. But um, the, it's, it, that 8K has got to cover your entire model. So for this size model, it's probably about right 8K. But if you wanted, if you were going to render, you know, very, very close to this thing, what I'd be tempted to do is split this model into several parts so that you can then have several 8K, 8K maps texturing it in different areas. So this kind of knuckle here, this leg here, that might be a separate object. And we do that in Max first. Um, and it's just being aware from the beginning how with the use of your model and what it's used for, because um, we might want to then um, go back and use the, uh, and split this guy up into like three or even four models. Because in the design of it anyway, um, you know, we're, we're basically, um, if we go to the artwork and look at some of the final images, um, you know, we're, you know, we're at this distance here. So we found with this model in particular that the actual mesh was a bit too low res. And we, we, we dealt with that with blurring and adding like scatter maps and things like that on it. But um, if we did this again, we'd probably split this model up into um, a, few separate, um, a few separate models so that we can, able, we can texture it more efficiently. Um, and you can see from the assets here, because they have kind of quite natural breaks in them anyway. So this could easily be broken there, and this could be a separate model from this. And it's just being um, more aware of, um, oops, being more aware of how to construct your model with the, with the limitations you have on the texturing and the modeling, basically. Um, so let's go back to ZBrush. 
and let's make him fit the screen. Lots of typing going on. Don't feel like you have to, to have to make notes. Obviously, um, for the for those of you in the class, um, you know these, DVD, these these will be turned into um, you know files to download, and you'll have all of this information to keep and take home once we edit it. But um, so let's go back to, um, to looking at our model. So let's get rid of this guy. Let's give a bit of a um, some look at some of these displacement uh, alpha maps that we've got here. So you kind of see. None of them are really appropriate for what we need if we're generating a realistic rock texture. Now, when you're working on the kind of base texture, uh, the base um, kind of like model texture, there's, there's a num numerous different ways you can kind of generate uh, a kind of stony effect. One, which is kind of like a quick and easy and uh, what most people will kind of start with, is the, uh, the surface noise. This generates quite a good base. Um, before we go into this, actually, sorry, let's, let's create a new layer. Um, and let's call this um, surface noise or noise. And the ZBrush is a very powerful um, procedural way of generating um, noise maps and things like that. Um, so if we go to surface noise, brings up a kind of separate window which we can kind of like use in the in the same way with the same controls as our um, as our model. But it's in a separate window. It's like a preview of what we're doing. And then we have this kind of curve editor and scale and strength and all, all different kinds of um, parameters we can play with. So let's just have a little play with this curve editor and see what we can do. So if we kind of start adding some points in here and then turn the scale up, um, oops, we can see we're adding this kind of surface noise. And then if we continue to play around with this, and this is this becomes quite good if you're creating like a flat concrete with holes in, you, you, you can kind of have quite a lot of control over um, over the, the way that this kind of noise looks, basically. So if we zoom in and have a good look at this, um, if we kind of as you can see, we've got a kind of bezier on our on our kind of curve at the moment, and we can kind of really play around with how this this affects the scene. Um, but if we kind of drag it away and then back in, we've now created a sharp point. Um, and if we do the same on another point here, then you can create a kind of flat effect with holes in it, which can be really good for um, kind of like larger flat surface concrete and things like that. Um, just generate a, you know, a lot of detail from. Um, but for the sake of this, for our model, we want something a little bit more organic. As a general rule of thumb, um, you don't want to, um, we want to kind of have our points at the bottom around mid-level, and I'll explain a bit about that in a second. The, the problem is when you go down, you can create the same effect up here, but essentially you'll have a kind of ballooning effect when you, when you apply this uh, mesh to your model, which is not desired at all. Um, so let's just let's get this to somewhere where we're roughly happy with, um, like a general noise. That looks quite cool. And this is, this is quite a quick way of generating quite a realistic um, rock. So if you're in a hurry and you, you've, you've generated a kind of base mesh in, in Max of a rock or, or, a, or a mountain or whatever it is for your scene, then this is a really good way of just going, right, I've got 10 minutes. I need to just bang out a, um, a displacement map for this um, at a relatively realistic um, level. Um, I've made some kind of general adjustments to my model and I'm just going to kind of um, export this out. Again, you can kind of mess around with a kind of scale. You can make that really fine or really, really big. Um, let's make it big, actually, for this one. Um, OK, then you press OK. Um, and you can see it in our model here, but it's not actually applied to the mesh. To do that, you have to press um, Apply to Mesh. Simples. Now, this might take a little bit of time. Um, and because we put our... Um, our kind of curve, the bottom of our curve in the middle, we haven't got any ballooning effect in the, in the model. And um, we have got this line that's come out of somewhere, but let's probably um, let's ignore that for now. Um, if we had that curve just willy-nilly going everywhere, then you'd, you'd find that the whole model would kind of scale in this kind of ballooned effect. 
And there's lots of ways we can control that, but just the easiest way is by um, messing around with that curve to, to be in the middle. So you're working from top to middle. And again, because we've got that on a layer here called noise, we can mess around with this effect. Um, and we, you know, we can kind of increase or decrease the, the effect of it. I think we can even have minus values. Um, and this is, it's thinking about this because it's at nine, 9 million um, polygons. So it's having a little think. Um, but if we increase this, When it eventually updates, is it going to update for me? We've lost our noise. Let's do a save while we're here. <laughs> Overwrite that file we made. It's having a bit of a freak out. Let's just um, hide him for a second. Let's try and get our noise back. I'm not too sure where he's gone. Let's see what subdivision level we're working at. why we can't see our noise effect there for some reason. Um, normally you can just play with these layers and turn the intensity off as normal. Maybe because that noise map was um, generated at 9 million, it just seems to be flickering quite a lot. Let's close him and open him again and see what happens. Still don't have our surface noise, which is annoying. Um, let's turn that layer off and try that again. See what, why that was. Okay, we just had our noise off. That's simple, um, but it should have been applied to mesh. Um, so let's look at this again. Let's delete this layer. Delete this layer. Go back to um, our surface noise. So you can see he's not baked in. Um, so let's just apply to mesh again. Okay, now that should be baked in. <laughs> so let's try this again. It doesn't like it, does it? Doesn't like changing the um, the amount of that noise. Seems to be when you change the trans the um, when you change the um, kind of opacity of that layer, it doesn't like it with the noise, and it kind of unbakes it um, in this really weird way. But um, mask by noise bake. Let's try it again. See, now we have double noise. So it's definitely baked in. It just doesn't like to be changed in the opacity, which is strange. But at least we can have him on a separate layer. Um, so that's good. So let's leave our noise back on. Let's bake. Let's have a look at the. Um, the HD geometry. So when you're in 9 million and you still haven't got enough detail, we can add our finer detail using HD geometry. Um, so let's add another brush um, or another alpha for our brush. Let's take this texture here just to, so we can see what we're doing. Um, let's go really far in. Let's go in here. And um, let's go to HD geometry. 
and let's press the divide. Let's see what happens there. So now it says 38 million in the total points. We haven't actually activated anything. So if we're kind of painting in here, this is still working at 9 million. What we have to do to activate our, um, our Sculpt HD is press this button or press A, or sorry, press this button, Sculpt HD. This is dividing again. That will create another subdivision level, which is even higher. So Sculpt, a, Sculpt HD, but then it says also A next to it. So some of, the, some of these buttons, they have the shortcuts displayed. And what you have to do is you kind of have to hover over your model and then say this from this part around, I'll, I'll press A, and it's kind of frozen for a second while it's kind of entering that um, HD mode. And it's not going to put your entire model in HD, and to see that more obviously, you, you can kind of see a, like a boundary, but to see that more obviously, click on transparency. And then it will show you which, which part of your model you're working in in HD, basically. Because there's no way it will be able to generate the whole, it kind of has a, even ZBrush has like a poly limit within uh, the program. And um, you'll find that the more you divide this and the more polygons you have in your total count, the smaller this kind of like area will be that you can actually work onto your model. And um, so now we're working in some pretty good detail here. Um, where we can start adding really, you know, fine, smooth elements. And again, we've kind of trapped ourselves. So we go to the side outside this window, and then we can still rotate around. Now, that's all good, but you might not want to go to all that detail but before texturing. You might want to kind of, well, how I like to work in ZBrush is sculpting and painting at the same time. Um, so I'm kind of going to go through um, on the kind of section like this, how, the, how that works. So again, pressing A will kind of go out, back out of your Sculpt HD. And now let's look at some of these other functions down here to do with painting and UV mapping. UV mapping is, in, is really interesting in ZBrush. It kind of, um, works in two ways and it depend, really really depends on your model dimen not dimensions but your model shape on, on which one you'll, you'll go with. Now I'll show you um, what some of these maps look like um, that you generate. Let's have a look. And maps, textures. See if I can find some of the, um, you can see I brought with me quite a, quite a library of textures which all these files are linked to. Um, <clears throat> let's look at the underwater, um, let's look at the rocks. So this is a, this is a ZBrush texture. What is that? Um, it's kind of, what it does is it kind of like divides your model up into squares and it, it uses the UVs that way. This is the most efficient ZBrush texture because you can see it fills the screen. This is something you generate if you don't want to edit afterwards, if you don't want to then bring into Photoshop and this is a very different kind of UV map, basically. They look really cool, but um, yeah, they're, they're not editable. You, know, you, you don't even really want to color correct this. This is, um, this is, is, this is what it will look like. Um, and then, again, all the maps, like um, normal maps and displacement maps, are kind of generated. So this is, this is a displacement map from that rock. This is a um, TIFF. It automatically generates TIFFs. Um, so this is just to show you what it, what it looks like. And this is how all that data gets brought back. And it should, it's just white and black information as a normal ZBrush model is. Um, but this is where all your detail will come back in, in, um, in 3D Max using, this, using these kind of maps. And the, it, it generates a normal map as well, which looks, yeah, as you would expect. Um, but I'll show you how to generate that in a, in a second, but you might not always want that. You might want, um, if we look at some of the boat rock, uh, the boat textures. Um, let's have a look here. Let's see if we generated one of them in a different way. So on some of them, we generated it like this, which is as you would normally expect a, a um, a map to look. And th this was kind of generated from ZBrush and then, um, you know, edited in Photoshop, basically. And we can kind of actually start to mess around with this. These were the sails on the boats, for example. And um, I'll show you two ways of doing this in, in ZBrush. So 
The first way that I showed you um, in, in as an example was the kind of the, the, um, the tiled map option. So when you're generating maps, you want to go to texture map. Um, you want to go to new texture. And you want to go to um, your UV map. And you want to basically um, generate the highest resolution texture you can, which is 8192 random. Um, but you want to generate this um, as a PUV tiles map. And that's what that map is that I just showed you. That's what, it, that's what the name of it is. <clears throat> so if I press that now, it will give me this message. Um, so what this is basically saying is that you want to generate this map at the lowest subdivision level. So you go back to your geometry and you go back to level one. And you can still see that the representation of that still, still keeps some of that, a lot, quite a lot of that data we've edited at a higher subdivision level. It's not like that data just completely goes away um, and only exists at that higher level. Um, it kind of remains um, in an optimized format at low res. But when you generate those maps, you have to make sure that you're working in a low subdivision level. Okay. So um, if we go to our UV map, we now press PUV tiles. And now it will say at the top, packing UV tiles, and it'll wait, and it'll do it, it'll take a little moment to, to generate. What this is doing is essentially signing a square to all, all the different parts of the model. Um, so it's, it's kind of unwrapping it in its, own, in its own way. Okay, so we're now back in. So if we just quickly, uh, if we get rid of this alpha and we just um, paint this mosaic techno, let's choose something a little bit more appropriate. Let's choose this um, on a spray. Let's just spray this on. Um, but you can notice before we can do that, we're not actually doing anything if we do that. We're just working in Z add mode. So we want to turn Z add off and we want to turn our RGB on, um, which we can't see anything. So if you go to our um, poly paint, um, we have to make sure that colorizes on poly paint from poly groups. Um, let's turn this to a white material so we can have a, have a look. RGB, uh, let's just. Let's see what we're doing here. Hang on a sec. Pull paint from texture. Um, texture off. Texture on. Give me one second. Where's our <coughs> UV map? Turn our transparency off. Our intensity. I'm still not getting anything there. Why is that? Let's have a look what we've got here. We're working on a different layer. Let's go back to our base layer. Let's problem solve this. That'd be a good option, mightn't it? Nope. Strange. Let's have a look at this. This is, yeah, that's very odd. Okay, right. Um, let's have a look. So we see if we can see what's going on here. You should be able to poly paint from texture. I'm just trying to figure out why that's not on, basically. Let's just have a quick look in our texture map. We're filling that space, but we want this on. Okay, for some reason it didn't generate our UV. That's probably one of the problems. Um, let's go try that again. PV tiles. You do have to make sure that you've, um, before you do any kind of detail work, that this is set up correctly. Sometimes the PUV tiles does, um, the, like the UV mapping of things do um, run away for some reason, like it happened there. Let's just have a look, see if we can do this again. Okay, so now 
for whatever reason, when we thought that that generated, it didn't generate um, that PUV tiles, even though it said it did. Um, so we do it again, make sure it has. And then in our polypaint, we now have polypaint from texture on, and we can actually start texturing this model. So do make sure that um, your UV mapping worked correctly, basically. Because if it, if it didn't, then you'll know, because the polypaint from texture won't, won't be available like it wasn't just there. So that was good that we were able to problem, problem solve that. Now, when we're painting this, you can see it's super low resolution um, because we're working in um, Subdiv 1. We only needed to work in Subdiv 1 because we, when we were generating our texture. Um, now we can go back to a really high subdivision level and actually start texturing our model with loads of detail. Um, now, let's just go into the highest level on our base here. Um, we don't want to work in HD straight away. What I like to do is, is coat the model in a kind of like in a texture to begin with, in a kind of like spraying it on, just so well, you know you're not working on a blank canvas. You've got you've got something to work with, something to see. Um, however, I don't use any of these any of these ones. I mean, this is probably the most appropriate kind of corally rock thing right here, but um, we want to use something much more custom made. So. Before we kind of go into the details of painting in, in ZBrush, let's have a look at some maps that we want to bring in. So let's go to um, ZBrush maps. These are just something I've pulled from the net. So rocks, for example. So we've got some decent rock textures that we can kind of start with. Um, this one was used quite heavily in the, in the one in the um, in the final models that we made. That I showed you the images for. Um, this might be quite good for uh, like a base. This one's particularly quite good. Um, so there's loads in there that we can play with. So let's just go to Photoshop, close down this displacement map. Um, let's take uh, this one. This one's quite good. So this is fine for a texture, but what will happen is if when we bring in that texture, it's really easy to bring in textures. We just go to um, the texture import, and then we just find that file and import it. So go to our ZBrush um, masks, rocks, bring in that texture. But it doesn't activate it straight away. It brings it in, but it doesn't activate it, which is kind of annoying. Um, so now we're kind of painting in like a base of that texture. We're kind of spraying it on, which is quite cool. Um, and the mapping, you know, when you're doing it only from one angle like this, you'll notice that the, kind of, the, the, the texture will kind of warp around the edges and stuff. So you want to really make sure that you give it a good, a good kind of coat. Um, but this isn't going to be good enough for our, for our model, really. Um, what I like doing is using the drag reflect and actually kind of dragging things on. But the problem with that is that you know because then you get the full map and you can kind of really start playing with the positioning and things like that. Um, the problem with that is that you you do get a um, like a square edge basically. You know, so you want to kind of sort that out. So that's why in Photoshop what we do is um, <clears throat> we um, add a few filters. Let's make this black and white. Let's um, use the kind of threshold. We might have that on a slightly less amount to bring some of the detail back in. Um, posterize maybe to kind of you, you only want like three levels to this really or five or um, you don't want it to be too. It depends what you want. You, any map can be really anything to be honest. Um, but let's make it like this for now. And then we also want to create a new layer and um, deal with our edge. Oh, I still got that. Still got that star thing from yesterday. Um, so let's go to. Um, our brushes. Oh, they've changed Photoshop. Where has he moved the brushes to? <clears throat> um, let's create a new brush. Let's use one of these templates. Let's kind of scatter it a little bit. It's not a science. This it's just it's just a kind of funny brush that we can kind of paint out in a bit more rocky way the edges. Um, Let's just see what that gives us. <clears throat> I never use opacity, I always use flow. 
Um, so let's just kind of like scatter out the edges of this so there's no hard edges to our thing. We're going to use this as an alpha channel within our ZBrush model for painting. When I get to each end of kind of the section for ZBrush, I'll be taking questions at the end. So for those of you online, um, let's just hold off until the end of each kind of sections and we'll, we'll deal with questions then. So say we're happy with this. We then save this out as a simple JPEG. Let's call it alpha at the end with the same name. Let's go back into ZBrush. And then we have our texture, and then we just load the alpha. So import, load that in there. Now we've got an alpha and our texture. Let's just save our project again. Um, or, or what's annoying is that it automatically goes back to the last kind of um, location you were in when you were doing your textures, which is annoying. Um, so let's go to save this in the same location. Underwater rocks, CG score one. And then let's see what this does. Um, let's just paint with no texture, a blank white area here, so that we can um, see it a little bit better what we're doing. Or a multicolored red texture, that's fine. <laughs> what ZBrush will do on spray mode, it will, it will automatically kind of use these two colors here. So that'll be red and black. And variations between um, you can see what it's doing <coughs> slightly different <coughs> colors going on so let's put it on a on a normal dot to get it consistent let's put these alphas back on and then Again, I like to use the, the uh, click and drag mode. And what we're doing there is that we can see that we're kind of painting on um, with a kind of more of a feathered edge. But what it's doing is that it's actually getting rid of um, the detail we have in the middle because the, the, uh, the map is too, too contrasting. So what we want to do, keep that top layer, but um, we want to kind of adjust some of our other layers so that um, we can bring some of that detail back in. So even if we lose our post rise and our threshold, because we might want that effect, you know, we might want to kind of patch it on afterwards, um, but we probably more realistically want um, something more like that. So let's save this. Call it alpha two. And then we can see when we load that in. <coughs> so now we have to find our texture again. ZBrush maps. Let's load that one. And then on, let's do a new area around the corner here. We can see we're kind of like dragging that on. And we can play with, um, we can play with our map in, um, in Photoshop until it's kind of giving us the right level of transparency. Because um, we might not want be quite so, um, I mean, for example, if we just exported, if we just exported that, <coughs> then we're literally only going to be using the inside of that mask, which is probably more what we want. Sometimes we want to kind of um, use the map itself to kind of, um, if we're just using it to kind of overlay on top of something else, we're not using it to kind of completely as the base. Um, but in this case, because we're on top of the white, it's really obvious um, that it's not kind of coming through strong enough. So let's load another one. Let's load that one. And then what that's going to do is give us kind of what we want in this case, which is kind of like our feathered edge, but then everything else is, is, um, is kind of coming through. But when working at a higher subdiv level, what I quite like to do is, um, so let's put these back on. I like to work in both um, RGB and Z add at the same time, because then you're actually sculpting with the image more. Um, and we'll see how that works. We'll put it on a quite extreme so we can see an example. When you now click and drag, um, 
it's actually taking the alpha only. So it's, this is why in um, this is why you might want to use the other one um, in some cases because it will actually give you um, the texture and the <laughs> and a bit too extreme. Um, it will give you the texture and the displacement of that texture, basically. So you can kind of see the fine details it's picking up. And you'll, you'll, you can do that, um, probably in this case, you want to kind of do that at, at, um, in HD. So if we go back into HD, um, we click on a region over here, we press A. Okay, we're now in HD. Um, let's turn on our transparency so we know our boundaries. Because the problem if you don't have the boundaries on, then you know you might be over here doing this and you're sculpting like that, but then you're creating a kind of cut edge through the boundaries. And without the transparency, it's quite easy to do that, and you'll notice that you've got funny edges everywhere. But at HD, you can really see that we're um, we're adding some quite nice detail. And in this case, it looks a bit weird because we're painting on white. But if we if we kind of sprayed on our base um, first, this will just be added detail with texture that we're kind of painting on. And that was kind of how we did a lot of the boats, uh, a lot of the rocks, was spraying on a base texture, and then kind of like um, adding kind of visual and displacement detail um, to it afterwards, basically. So this kind of works a bit better here, for example. Um, you've kind of got a base texture and then you've got this super detail um, of displacement and um, and texture adding at the same time and when you've kind of got um, the visual kind of bump as well as the kind of um, as well as the kind of texture difference between those things then it really stands out as being a kind of high resolution thing and the way that the rocks are tech the, the texture we, we use lots of different um, textures and lots of different maps to kind of generate slightly different um, areas and it's, it's fun to play around with um, with the different different textures on the models and seeing what effects they have and spraying them on slightly differently and just using the, the um, RGB in some cases especially with a pen when you have a slightly better touch to um, to how these models are working um, and, and they're kind of fall off and things but you can kind of still, you can see how we can kind of create quite interesting um, variants and textures just with simple um, simple painting and simple kind of sculpting on the model basically. Okay, so let's just go out of HD here. Let's press A. That's great. It's on our model, this bit of texture. But um, how do we kind of save this texture? More often, probably before now, I should have um, gone into our texture map and um, pressed new from polypaint which will basically give us it will kind of add our texture we've created to our uv map that we generated so let's just wait for this to get out of hd so let's go to our texture map and then press new from polypaint so at the moment oh my god our texture map is white we know we haven't saved any of that information so if we press new from polypaint um, this is going to take a few seconds but it will basically fill this up fill this square up into um like the map that I showed you at the beginning. So it'll kind of divide all of these squares and then place it in here like this. So you can see it, you can kind of see it there. So all the white areas, are the white kind of dotted areas are, are, um, are obviously from here. Um, so that's what our kind of texture currently looks like. And that's kind of saved within the scene now. So we don't have to worry about losing that anymore. Uh, now we can go back and add more detail and finish our texture. Um, but it's good practice just to go in here. Again, because sometimes the, 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 the um, uh, things kind of get a little bit lost in ZBrush sometimes, like we saw with the UV mapping, it's really good to just go and check that this is still linked, the UV map's still there, um, and that you can kind of constantly update the, uh, the new from poly paint uh, here. So we're, we're constantly saving our, our painting. Sometimes you can kind of just lose yourself, have fun with kind of adding loads of detail. And you can be there for hours, and, and sometimes you haven't actually saved your, your painting. Um, <clears throat> so you can see here that the, te the texture's on now. So if I start painting, nothing, nothing's going to be here because it's displaying my, my pre-saved texture instead of allowing me to um, update my model. 
No, I, I am actually destroying, I'm, I'm actually painting here, but it's not showing it. So if I turn texture off here, now I can start painting, basically. So you have to make sure that once, because when you press new from poly paint, it will automatically display your texture here. So you just got to make sure you turn that off there. You're not turning, you're not unlinking anything. You're just making sure that you're then now going back live into the viewport for painting, um, painting our model. That's the texture, but we, ha we, still haven't we still haven't saved anything else. We haven't, we haven't saved the displacement or the normal map. And it's exactly the same process. We go just underneath texture map, displacement map, create texture map. Now this is going to give me an error message. Map cannot be created while at the highest subdivision level, right? So what this, what this needs is um, you to go back to the lower subdivision level again. And that's so ZBrush can calculate the higher subdivision levels and generate the map from that, basically. So if we now go back to our displacement um, map, create displacement map, it'll think about it. And it's going to read all of that HD geometry that we kind of sculpted and we spent ages on. Um, See, so creating displacement map here. This sometimes takes a little bit longer than the, than the other ones, but still not that long relatively. <clears throat> and then we, once that's generated, we, we do the same for our normal map. Same process. And it just does it automatically. You don't have to really worry about it. So now we can see there, we've generated our displacement map. Success. Normal map, um, create normal map. Let's create that normal map. This is for our bumps. <coughs> so again, we have to kind of, um, it's your job as an artist to decide whether that, this 8K map is enough for this, um, for this sized object. And depending on the detail that you need for your object, whether it's going to be good enough. There's no point, uh, I think, for the, for when I first did the rocks, I think I wasted so much time making the ZBrush model absolutely perfect, only to realize that um, that level of detail was never going to come back in 3D. And that for many of the models, it should have been split up into separate subtools. So that, the normal map's taking about the same time as the displacement. So now we've generated our normal map based on uh, the lowest subdivision level that we're in. So we've got this pretty odd texture here now, uh, but it's got some, um, it shows the kind of basics of, of how those rocks are created with the different maps. It's kind of up to you to kind of be creative with the mapping, the shaping and everything else, the sculpting. It's ZBrush, you, you kind of realize when you use ZBrush that it's not something that's just going to produce amazing work for you. It's up to you as an artist um, to actually have the sculpting and painting ability to, to create what you want. Um, it's not a kind of button pushing right or wrong thing. It's very much a subjective artistic um, thing. But it's great because it's actually, once you break through the kind of um, the initial barrier of the interface, then it, um, it really allows um, less technical artists, I guess, to actually really get in and be creative with the technology. So now we've generated our displacement texture map. Um, we can go back and we can fiddle with things. I, I won't. We can, get, we can continue subdividing and continue sculpting, continue to paint until we're kind of happy with this. Um, and then what we need to do is <coughs> um, say we're happy with this. We want to bring this back into, into Max and see our result. Um, we have to go to Go Z. It's the same button that we use to go from Max. Um, what we'll do is. Sometimes this only works when you have no Max open, but we'll have a look and see what happens. So basically, the first time you do this, um, actually, um, let's just see this calculate. File save to disk. So what this is going to do, this is going to export TIFFs, of, or 8K TIFFs of our maps, and it's also going to export an OBJ of the, uh, of the model. And what it should do, the GoZ function, is it kind of brings the model into Max automatically with the maps linked. Because we went into HD, this might take a little bit of time. Um, some of the models that we made um, took a long time to export, um, just because of the 
level of detail we were going into with the HD and the fact that the models themselves were very, very large. So this will export our mesh at 148,000, not 38 million, thank God. Um, so hopefully all of that detail will come back in the displacement. So still thinking about it. Okay, so it's done it now. But what it should do is, is uh, open up a new Max, which I don't think it's done because we've got Max open. Let's minimize this. Yeah. So it hasn't it hasn't done it because we've um, we've got Max open. So let's close let's close Max down. Oh, it has done it. It's done it in Max. It's done it in the Max that was open. Okay, so that's good. Um, Stuck on pan mode. There we go. So it's brought it in in the exact same place as we left our original. So that proves that um, whenever we move our Max model, um, our ZBrush model, or re import the tool, it's not got any coordinate locations um, relevant to that. So you can see here we've got our model. It's generated at the lowest subdivision level. Let's just turn on the default lights. Oh, it's on the default. Um, but what this does, if it still does it, if we look at the material editor, it makes it mentor a material. Um, and it converts our render settings to mentor a as well. So we need to change this to V-Ray. And we need to change this to V-Ray. What it does, um, it kind of creates this direct X shader thing. Um, which can be, I'm not too sure what it does. It kind of like gives you a better preview of your texture. I think that's the idea. Um, I've not really gone into the details of this because I don't really use it. I always just, um, I always just make the V-Ray material work. Um, so what this gives us is a material with a diffuse. Hang on one second, is this the right material? Yeah, you can see here, this was the different material. Um, you can see here that it's kind of displaying our map a little bit funny. And it's given us a standard material. Um, so what, and it's mapped that with a, the normal map in a normal bump in the bump, which is what we want, and the, and the texture in the diffuse. Um, and the displacement we have to add ourselves with a V-Ray displacement modifier. But first of all, we want to make this a V-Ray material. So um, if we just move this there for now, just in case we lose it. Um, let's just convert to um, V-Ray materials. So it's made this a V-Ray material now, and it's kept, should have kept our maps. Yeah, so it's kept our maps. And we can display the, uh, display the RGB. But it's giving us a kind of um, quite a funny display, and we'll see if that renders in or not. Um, that's why that, I think that's why it kind of uses by default the, um, it's not there anymore because we converted it to V-Ray, but that DirectX shader um, map, which kind of displays these, um, these tiled maps in a slightly better way. But let's, hopefully that won't render in, we'll have a look. So let's just um, see what we have here. Let's put a light in. Just leave a normal dome. For now. Actually, let's put a direct light in. We'll probably see the effect a little bit better. Um, ah, it's already got a light. Fantastic. Here's one I prepared earlier. <coughs> so let's plonk a camera in. Let's just see what this um, is doing at the moment with no displacement and if our texture is actually going to render like that. It's 
Good to point out actually where these textures are stored. By default, um, they'll kind of be stored in a funny location. So this is stored in users, public, PixLogic, Gozi projects, default, which isn't really why we want them. Um, so we can obviously go to that location and move them. I'll leave them there for now. But um, this, this, if you don't clear this, this can get pretty big pretty soon. These are, these are not big textures. And it will also store the model there as well. Um, so you want to kind of save this file, save these, like, you know, relink these textures in a, in a smarter location on the server or whatever, and then um, clear this file out, basically, because this, this folder can get quite large if you don't keep on top of it. OK, so let's do a quick run test. Turn on our radiance map and light cache. <coughs> Throw priority. <coughs> Turn some of these calls off so that we can uh, keep the audio. Okay, let's just do a quick test. So you can see that the that kind of texture thing, although this is a very bright um, render. You can see that the texture kind of error that lives in the viewport isn't in our um, isn't in our model, which is good. So let's just um, have a little look at what we need to do now. Let's just put a very very plain in, so we can have a floor. Quickly just adjust our sun. <clears throat> By default, it's quite nice. It, it um, puts the blur, takes the blurs off, which you don't often want. Let's have a look at that area that we uh, did in a bit more detail. On the other side of this. So you can see our bump is doing loads here, actually. Uh, it's doing more than more than it probably should. Um, it's giving us yeah quite a lot of that detail has been brought back in from the uh, from the painting. And um, it's almost, in certain cases, you actually don't need the displacement, to be honest. Because this is, there's no way that that resolution in that mesh is reflected in that render. The render looks much, much higher resolution. Now that's all coming from our bump. And the bump is, because um, it's the normal map, um, and it's kind of attached through the normal bump in V-Ray, it works much, much better than a black and white map in that it just plonked in in the, in the bump map setting, basically. Because it has up and down data. It has positional data. That's what these maps are. Um, they're, they're much more powerful. Um, but let's just, have a, let's just show the workflow for, um, for adding this texture map in anyway. Um, so let's add our bitmap. We have to go to that stupid location. Add our texture map. 2D mapping's fine. Um, there's a few settings that we need to kind of talk about here. Um, one is the amount and the shift. These have to be the same. This is how much is going up and how much is going down, basically. Because um, how ZBrush works is it exports the gray to black map. So you kind of have to set um, your text map min to minus one, which is already done by default here, which is great. But it used to put this on one. Um, all that's going to do is it's gonna, just going to lift everything rather than push, push and pull stuff down. Because you, you, when you're sculpting in ZBrush, you're not just lifting out, you're pushing in and you're, you're kind of adding emboss as well as um, uh, the other way around. So we need ZBrush to read the gray as minus one, as if it was white. So the white point becomes one. 
um, or z the white point is zero, basically. So we need to do that. Um, this looks pretty high, uh, point one. Uh, it depends on the scale of our model, obviously. Um, that, we can just tweak this in test rendering. Um, so we just do a kind of quick test render now. You can see that we're really getting that, that kind of displacement back in our model. And all that detail we kind of put on. But the thing is, it's probably come out too, too much because our, our, the strength is too much here. And we can also probably increase our resolution. Um, so let's put this on 8,000 because that's the resolution of our map. But this will take considerably longer to, to kind of process because we're working with an 8K TIFF. Um, what I tend to do, if you're working with a model on its own, that's fine. Um, but if you're working in a very large scene like we created, um, like the underwater scenes, this is going to want to be a JPEG, basically. The, the only thing you really want to be um, a, like a TIFF is the normal map. Um, I think the, the displacement and the, t and the basic JPEG uh, for the diffuse, uh, the basic image for the diffuse, um, you can get away with it being a JPEG, basically. It wants to be quite a, a high, highly saved JPEG. You don't want to have too much degradation because of the way that ZBrush generates the, the map with the squares, um, if, you, if you have too much kind of artifacts, you're going to have that showing up in the way that it kind of um, makes it again. So this is clearly taking ages now because we've increased this 2D mapping resolution to 8K. We might not need to do that. That doesn't necessarily have to be um, reflective of um, your size of your map. So let's just try um, 2000, see what happens with that. Again, the precision and the tight bounds, um, this is just the kind of like the way that um, the model reads the, the UVs. Let's try that again. Okay, it's a bit faster, still, still a bit slower. We should have probably decreased our amount as well. That's probably a bit too high. Um, but it's going to give us a more detailed, um, more detailed mesh, more detailed version. We can keep, what I tend to do is just keep pushing this until, until I find that it's too slow. So you want that to be as high as possible, really. Um, but we probably don't want this to be as high as this. That's, you know, 10 centimeters up, 10 centimeters down. Um, but again, this largely depends on the scale of our model here. So let's have a look. Um, let's just have a look at what size this is. Let's just get out of full screen here. What size is this model? <clears throat> okay, so it's quite large. It's like ten meters, yeah, over ten meters, like twelve meters, basically. So um, that'll kind of depend on how how big you want this displacement to be. Let's just have a quick look at how our um, gamma set up. So yeah, let's try this again on a slightly lower, lower setting. And then we'll render this without the displacement on the normal map and we'll see the difference. We... So we save this out and we generate this again without this turned on and the normal map off. We can see what detail we're bringing back and what the model actually is. So this is the model and with the displacement and the bump map, we're bringing back all that extra detail that we worked on basically. Um, so that's the basic workflow of, um, of Max, and, Max and ZBrush with the, with the texturing. You just have to be on top of um, what order you do things in. Um, but once you've done it once, it's one of those things that it's very easy to remember and uh, do, it, do it again, um, bar a few 
a few little niggles that ZBrush still has. Um, so yeah, that was basically how the rocks were created. Um, and there was just lots of iterations that were made um, to um, produce the kind of variants that we wanted. Um, and we wanted some of them to be a bit more elaborate and some of them to be nearer the camera and kind of like arching over the camera. Um, <clears throat> the one thing that we did do um, was to um, draw, have a kind of saved version of these models that we then called, um, that we then created the masks from basically. Let's just get this back to, there we are. Yeah. If you press shift, you can, you can kind of snap to different views. It's quite a good little shortcut. Snap to top, snap to left or right, and so on. And that kind of gives you back your base. And then again, turn on Y, so you can't rotate yourself out of view. So say we were happy with this, um, then what we would do to, because obviously in our, um, in our final images, what we did was we have all this kind of like um, coral kind of scattered over it basically. Um, and some, some of the effects of our displacement was actually quite extreme. Um, we have kind of smoother areas and much, much harsher areas. We tried to be a bit more natural with the rock. Um, but then we also have all this coral which is kind of scattered all over it. And um, the way we did that was to just have a saved version of, the, um, of each of the rocks in ZBrush. So if we, if we as a tool, um, so if we, if we just save this project as it is, just to um, save where we are. <clears throat> and then we save, save as the tool. And we call it mask. And what we're going to do is paint, we're just going to paint a black and white mask of where we want that scatter to be. And we already have our library of um, kind of like underwater elements. Um, so ZTL, ZBrush tool. So we'll call this mask. And then we'll just um, let that save. And then we'll get rid of the textures we have in here, or at least we'll get rid of the, um, the, the color texture. We don't want to um, Z add, so we'll leave that off. Um, we want to, um, we can keep the, UV, the, all the UVs are already generated. We don't have to do that. But this is where you really want to be able to be on top of um, that folder with the textures in, because we're going to re-export this. And it's going to automatically overwrite those, those textures we made before. So we want to go into that folder and actually get those textures out and save them somewhere else. So we go into our default ZBrush folder and you can see all this stuff that's there. That's just been, you know, it's just there. And some of this is the, um, uh, the de some of the default tools that are in ZBrush, some of which are, are, are generated tools. So you can see here, that's generated the max, um, I, well, X max file. Um, we've got OBJ, um, material files, uh, and these are our three textures here. Um, I'm not bothered about the other ones if they get over it because I'm not using the OBJ. I'm, it's coming straight into Mac so I'm saving that myself manually. So I'll kind of cut these out. Um, <clears throat> and let's put them in um, the textures. Let's put them in the underwater rocks. Let's have a new folder called CG School. <coughs> And then we'll relink our model um, to, the, to those things. We can do it at any time. Um, but just so that we just did that so we don't overwrite anything when we re-export this. Because what we want to do here is um, we want to go to uh, polypaint or texture map rather, turn our texture map off so we can start painting and just fill this, fill this with white with a solid color, intensity of 100. Uh, let's increase our draw size, decrease our focal shift. Let's just coat this. And then we'll kind of be custom painting our, our scatter map, basically. And we do this, we do this a lot. And it basically, we, we've just completed another project where we, we've used this technique again, um, where we kind of like paint a custom scatter map onto our rocks and you can then use we use multi-scatter you can use forest pack whatever you're used to um, you can then use to um, scatter 
things onto this object. In our case, for this project, it was, it was coral. You could just add fine grains of ro little, tiny rocks to add that extra little detail um, to, to your models, and it, it would look fantastic. So we've got, it, we've got this white model now. Let's just go to black. Um, <clears throat> and here we can start to, um, if you right click, you get all, a lot of menus here that are quite useful. It's just like a condensed version of lots of different menus everywhere else. Um, but we can change our draw size and can put this on a scatter. Um, and then we can um, lower our intensity. And we don't need to at all work in any kind of high res um, version for this because um, it's only the, we're not really taking texture detail. This is only position detail for where we want the, um, the things to be. So we don't want anything to grow underneath, so we'll just grow stuff on top. We'll kind of generate this map very quickly. And we can make this as, as good as you want. So we want some rock, some kind of extra detail here. <clears throat> and you can have multiple maps, multiple scatter maps doing different things, or multiple, um, you can have one which kind of adds detail to the rock mesh, one which is more coral, whatever you can think of really. You might have moss or grass growing on your, on your mountain. Uh, you can do it in a similar way. So these principles I'm teaching will be applicable for lots of different scenarios. In our scenario, it was these quite abstract things. Um, but in a normative scenario, it might be grass on a hill, it might be, um, it might be any, anything really. So once we've generated our map, we then go to um, new from poly paint. We don't care about the displacement or, nor or the normal map. When we go to GoZ, it will export those, um, but we don't care. We don't, need, we don't really need them um, anymore. <coughs> so we've got this. Let's press GoZ again. Um, because we've saved this, what I might do um, is um, try and get rid of the higher subdivision levels. So if I freeze subdiv level, it will hopefully, no, nah, didn't like that. Let's not do that. Let's just export it exactly how it was a second ago. <laughs> um, I was trying to do, actually, yeah, there we go. I was delete the higher so that it's not having to think about all that displacement detail again in this process. Because for this tool, we've already saved this out as a separate tool. Um, we can delete all that higher information so it makes that export process a little bit faster because um, it's not trying to, to do that. So let's just press GoZ again. Before we do that, let's just save our max file in here. Oops. Okay, that's saved. Not yet. So let's press GoZ again. Automatically brings in our uh, kind of switches to max. And again, this I've have had this not be not work all the time. The GoZ function doesn't. It's not a bulletproof system yet, I don't think. Um, and it kind of depends on quite a few factors. Sometimes I've had to close max down and reopen. Um, it's clearly thinking about something here. So let's try getting out of isolation mode. Where's the isolation button gone? Can anyone see the isolation button? <laughs> This? That's the material editor. Ah, yeah, there we go. I don't use that. That's cool. Um, so it hasn't brought in our ZBrush model. 
But the benefit of what we just did, um, if we wanted that to work properly, we'd close down Zebra uh, Max and we'd, we'd, we'd press Go Z and it would kind of in, it would open up Max and bring it in in a fresh scene. Sometimes when you've got stuff, especially the stuff that you brought ZBrush in before in a Max file, it can be a little bit unreliable. So I would I would do it in a cleaner way and close Max down and um, and kind of press ZBrush then. Luckily for us, we don't actually need that model. We just need the map. So if we go back if we go back to um, that folder, we can see that it's generated the map. It's generated the all the maps we want. So all we need to do is cut that out. Um, we can we don't care about these. They can stay there or be over it. And then we can plonk this in here. And uh, it's already called mask texture because that was that was our tool was called mask. So now <clears throat> what we can do is um, isolate this again. Remember this little guy here. That's cool. Um, we can um, put a multi scatter in, which is what we use uh, at Factory 15. We use this quite a lot, and then we can. Um, have, say, our objects, our coral, or our grass, or whatever it is. Uh, by surface, or by spine, whatever, but we want to do it by surface. We want to click on our main object. We want to add in our box. Then we can see that we've given it, it's kind of scattered all over it. But we want to kind of mask this, so we want to kind of um, add our mask of a bitmap. We want to locate our, um, our map. Not there, they're in um, in the water. Rocks, CG school. That's our, that's our new, um, this can definitely be a JPEG. This does not have to be a, a TIFF, but we'll load that in for now. Um, and you can see that it's kind of like, um, it's kind of not done it, I don't think, actually. Let's have a look. I think what we do need to do is, um, let's load that texture in here. The normal bitmap. Let's put that as a UV mapping of two. And then, <coughs> oops. Click on our object, UV map to select our multi scatter, copy in our mask. See, so hopefully, this should work. If we just what we can do to check what that map is actually doing because it is definitely distributing across that map, but if we make that map in the bitmap. Uh, so if we, if we make a kind of clone of this material here, um, and then we put this into the bitmap, <clears throat> and then apply that to our object, we can see what that map is actually doing. So you can see what's happened here is that um, when we, it's good that we've kind of troubleshooted this actually. What's happened is that because we deleted the um, other subdivision layer, um, actually has it done it? Yeah, no, it's got nothing to do with the subdivision layer. Yeah, my thought was that in ZBrush, because we generated, because um, we deleted the higher subdivision layer, um, that screwed up the UVs of the model. But actually, it hasn't at all. Um, sometimes that can happen if you um, if you constantly change the or delete the lower specifically if you delete lower because um, you've generated those UVs at a lower at the lowest subdivision level. If you delete the lower, then you would have deleted your UV map basically. Um, and I thought the same thing had happened with the higher, but it hasn't, which is good. Um, so it's good to just check that um, when you're when you are affecting the kind of subdivs, just make sure that your UVs haven't actually um, changed. So we can see here that with the, with the um, our map is fine. Um, we've got the same viewport thing as we did um, from the other one, but it's the, the 
The map is gen is not screwed up. It's fine um, from from the um, from our original file. Let's have a look at this again. We don't need to EV map it on at all. It should just kind of go on as one. The the display of this shouldn't quite be like that. It is kind of doing it in the roughly the right area. And again, I mean, because we've rendered that on, if we if because we've kind of added that to the texture map now in the diffuse, let's just see what's happening to that render, um, to that texture if it's rendering in the correct way. I'm not convinced it is at the moment. So let's have a look at this. Let's see if we can get this working better. What we'll do is, we didn't save that ZBrush file, let's just make sure. So let's load the mask again. Let's just make sure without deleting the highest subdiv level and re-export that, I get that map again and see if that makes a difference. So let's quickly do the same thing again. Let's, um, <clears throat> let's paint this guy. Take the uh, texture map off and just give him a paint at full intensity. We'll paint a simpler area so we can really see if that map is kind of working with the UVs or not. Okay, so everywhere is white now. Let's just do it on kind of circles here and here. The knuckles, another one up here. So let's do this in a really obvious way so we can really see how that's working. New from Polypaint. <laughs> Strange. So then let's press go Z again. I was doing a few strange things when we do that. Displaying some quite interesting things here, which I've never quite seen before, which looks quite cool. It's not quite what we're after. Um, so we'll try this again. we shouldn't really be getting this display like this. <clears throat> it should display. Um, you might see a bit of squaring with the resolution change, but you shouldn't be getting that level of squaring on the map from the UVs. And we can see that the UVs were generated properly in the original one, um, even though it displayed funny because it rendered fine. figure out what's going on here. Awesome. Oh, there we go. Let's have a quick look. Let's delete this UV map.
Yeah, so the same thing happens whether we have that on or not. Let's just take that map again and see if that makes any difference. <laughs> Mask one, let's load that in and see. So you can see that it is actually loading in the right place. You've just got this really weird squaring, which I've never quite had before. Um, I, th it, I think it is just a viewport thing, but let's just double check it when we, um, when we render in. It might be something to do with the graphics card or the, um, or the display driver. It could be numerous things. But hopefully this isn't. Um, yeah, so you can see here that it's doing the opposite. So it is working. So it is working now. Um, so we basically, the lesson learned there is that generate your UVs for your mask um, with the full mesh. So you don't delete the higher, higher res, the higher details, because it does take that, um, it does take that information when it exports it. Um, even when the even when the UVs are generated at a lower level, so yeah, lesson learned. Don't delete anything. Leave it exactly the same, and just create a new um, a new version of your model with a new paint texture. So what all we need to do now here is um, within this mask is invert the effect of it, because all our boxes are kind of coming around um, around our holes rather than the other way around. So just in the output of the texture, just invert it, and then you'll see that our boxes are now um, on, on those black areas. Again, ignore this. Um, I've not seen it quite that bad, but it, you can still see the effect of where it is. And I think it's a display driver thing. I'm not too sure why. So anyway, you can see all these boxes are doing. They're all kind of facing upwards. We want to change that immediately. Um, obviously, we want, we want to add more randomness, but to get them to follow the normals, um, we need to um, go to rotation and then just use normal one. So it's super easy. And then that, all that does is it kind of places everything coming away from our model in a, much, in a much better way. And this will allow our moss or grass or coral or whatever we use on our mountains and rocks and things like that just to be coming, for, coming out in a much more natural way. Um, and what this gave us, <clears throat> what this gave us is, um, let's have a look here. Go to the full res ones. What this gives us is um, like scenes where we can have these rocks, and we kind of really painted this this texture so that, that we can really fill our um, our models with the, with this intricacy. So there's actually very little actually in, in this particular scene that remains from that rock. It's just the kind of form that we've kind of used to um, to scatter these to scatter these things across. Um, likewise, we had a similar technique with the boats. I'll, I'll kind of go through that in a second. We uh, we painted the boat, and then we used um, kind of more grassy moss to kind of like scatter on top. And it was very, very, very effective in um, in creating that kind of really rich um, kind of detail uh, that we were looking for, and this kind of overgrown, overgrown detail. Um, so again, here you can kind of see some of them we've left more bare bones, we've kind of stripped them back, but some of them we've really filled with this kind of coral stuff and it's quite, it's quite cool. You can see here where that resolution I was talking about um, wasn't high enough in that base mesh um, for these images really. I mean, it kind of gets, gets away with it to a certain extent, but when you look at it, it's not ideal. This bit could be a lot better. And we would have solved that if we were to do that again um, by kind of cutting the model into several pieces um, and texturing things separately. Because that 8K texture we've exported has got to cover this entire thing. And for this particular object, it wasn't high enough. So sometimes that 8K texture will be enough, uh, and sometimes it won't be, and you'll have to kind of cut your model into different elements, basically. So that's the, that's the basic workflow um, in the end. It's, it's kind of good that um, there were some problems in there, because it's, that's, what, that's what you're going to get when you kind of do these things and to kind of troubleshoot some of the issues that might happen and realize the extent, um, the limitations in what you can do from ZBrush to, to Max. One thing I would note is that what we ended up doing um, was basically having two versions of the same model. Um, one was a kind of like, um, essentially what we did was we, dec we decimated one. Um, so these would be in the exact same place. Um, let's just collapse this. Uh, 
<coughs> so using the, um, <coughs> the pro optimizer, calculate our mesh, made this like 1% or something like that, um, collapse. And then basically what we did was we kind of made, um, this was mainly for scene up. Um, we'll, we'll be going into detail into the actual scene setup in a second. It just, it's just so that we can kind of um, have a really quick scene. We just have like this in the viewport and we group all this together um, so that we can basically um, have a very quick um, scene setup um, and be able to fly around the model very quickly, move things around the camera very quickly, uh, but then still working with the high resolution meshes. So this, so this box will be renderable, but then this, this optimized um, model that we've just created um, won't be renderable. We'll have that um, just unchecked there. And that just, and what we even did was um, have the multi-scatter linked to the low resolution mesh. Um, so that, um, that whole multi-scatter element was much faster as well. So there was, because the scenes that they were set up, you'll see um, later on, were extremely heavy um, with this file. I mean, you're talking about models several models nearing a couple of million polys each um, in, in some cases, which were um, proxied out. What we'd also do is pro proxy out the big mesh, but still have it display as box. Um, and then we have the, um, these little guys here um, displaying in the viewport, just so we can, just for speed purposes, basically. Has this always been here? Or is that, um, is that something new for 2014? <laughs> we're using 2012 in the office, so I don't think that one's there in 2012. Um, so yeah, that's the basic workflow on how these things were created. Again, these these are the low are the low resolution versions. Um, pow. Um, so you can see that these are the low res ones, and the high res ones would have been proxied out and um, and displayed as box, so that we we can't actually see them. But the same principles as what we've just gone through um, apply to all of these all of these different models, basically. But again, the, less, the lesson we learned was that we would never make this model in one model. This would, be, this would now be split up into several models to allow our texture to be more detailed. So were there any questions about that workflow before we move on to the second, the second thing I was going to go through with ZBrush? Any questions at all? Everyone's happy with that? Anything online? Great. So, <clears throat> the next thing I'm going to talk about is a bit about the boats that were made. Um, this was kind of quite a happy accident, actually, when we discovered this technique. Um, and it looks quite impressive, and, it, and it, um, the kind of detail that it kind of um, gives you within these boats were quite, um, was quite interesting. This, this kind of really kind of molded effect that we got with the mesh. Um, I guess can be used for loads of different things. We used it to kind of basically merge everything together. And it's that same uh, method we were looking at a second ago with the DynaMesh. And I'll show you how we kind of use that for the boat. So I'll, I'll load one of the boat models um, and show you kind of how that worked. Hopefully now everyone's a little bit more comfortable with the interface on ZBrush. Those of you who haven't ever used it before, some of you might have. but. Um, once you kind of know the basics, it's very easy to kind of take that and be really, really creative with it and apply that to lots of different situations. <clears throat> okay. So let's load the, um, one of the boat scenes. <clears throat> load this one. So the way that these kind of um, the boats were, were made was essentially again using the kind of free stuff we could find on the internet uh, of boats. There's loads of free boat models and things like that. We weren't being any, we weren't looking for textures or detail or anything like that because we knew we'd, we'd generate that ourselves. Um, but we needed like, enough assets to kind of create a um, an interesting effect, and we wanted these kind of creating like a sunken, rusted, eroded. Boat, you know, initially sounded like a heck of a lot of work, um, but I'm hopefully going to show you how simple it was. Um, so you can see here the way that this kind of geometry is, is even though this is the low res, 
version. And the way that everything's kind of been welded together um, and the kind of holes in the geometry and everything like that um, is creates a really cool, really cool effect. And um, we have kind of like all different bits of boat um, and bits of cars and all sorts of, you know, we've got this guy here. Um, this computer man's up. <clears throat> close you the max file and give it a little break. Let's save that. Oh yeah, I think it was just loading the multi-scatter actually on this one because that wasn't on a second ago. Um, so again, the way that this everything's kind of fused together, like all the kind of points are kind of really nicely eroded together and um, that was something that um, you know, we have little bikes down here, and it really looks kind of like corroded. And it's an effect you can achieve really easily with the DynaMesh. And um, I'll show you how in a second, if I can go to one of the base models. So these were just models that were positioned, um, you know, quite manually. Um, if we, I don't think it's in this file, the original. Let's have a look. If we unhide all, some of the original boat models. Now this, well, this one was one of the scenes that was set up for rendering. Um, so this has got lots of cameras in, basically, which was kind of set up for rendering these different things out. Uh, I'll go through some of the kind of scene setups after I've done the content creation. But this was just to create some quite dynamic, um, you know, camera positions, you know, for these boats, basically. Because um, we knew that this, 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 these weren't the main parts of the artwork, but it, once we did design the boat and made the boats, it was quite nice to kind of produce lots of images for because um, they were quite nice nice things. And it was also kind of tests for doing post-production underwater and that kind of thing. So um, the kind of content we generated along the way <coughs> when, when doing these assets um, formed the kind of artwork package that we created. It wasn't just the kind of final images. It was all the, all the kind of content along the way, um, which kind of added to the kind of um, the visual narrative that we were trying to create and all the design work and things like that. But I'll open up the other model, which will have the the raw boats in before they were um, before they were meshed. So you can see here, <clears throat> kind of got an array of different crappy boats, basically, um, and it's just kind of going through and picking apart the shapes and the bits that you like, and then just kind of mashing it all together in one big um, one big kind of thing. <clears throat> I think that was another another one that we created. So you kind of assemble this. It's kind of one big, one big kind of model. Likewise with this one, we assemble this, um, and then the key thing was kind of collapsing it to certain elements. Again, if we were to do this, if we were to do this again, we were when we did this was after the rocks, so we were slightly more aware about the resolution issue. But we um, we didn't really need to get too close to to these things, especially not for the final artwork. Um, I mean, we did for the kind of the mess about artwork, but um, yeah, so we've got some um, duplication here, which we don't need. We don't need this element here, so we'll just delete that for a second. We'll save this as CG school. But essentially, once you've kind of assembled your your thing, um, we went through and manually um, deleted a few like polygons and things like that to kind of create holes ourselves. Um, it was nowhere near the, the kind of detail that. Um, we, that we wanted, and we didn't want to have to go in and do this all manually. I mean, we added like bits of holes manually, but they're all they're all kind of triangulated, um, and we wanted to kind of explore other ways of kind of creating um, this kind of fused, rusted, rusted look. And we found out that um, these are actually, or it should be, if we double check, um, these are actually got a very thin shell on it. And we found that when you bring shelled objects, very thin shelled objects into ZBrush, um, and then you use DynaMesh, it kind of like optimizes the mesh in a really kind of cool way, which gives you that kind of, it literally instantly gives you that, um, that kind of rusted, that rusted effect when you play around the settings a little bit. But what we have here, we have two, two main objects. We have um, our, all of our kind of boat steel stuff, which is going to be textured together. Again, if we wanted to, we could have these separate, but the, the, the idea for this was that we have this all meshed as one fused thing. And then we have our, um, our sails. <coughs> so what happens here, 
if we, if we select these two objects, let's close down ZBrush. Don't really want to save that. What happens here if we go Z this? Because we've got two objects selected, it'll automatically give us two subtools. So it'd be good to talk about that. And that's a really good way of not only layering in, um, in layers, but also working with large models with multiple different elements um, together in one ZBrush scene. So, um, if we click and drag that into the viewport now, awkwardly, and press edit, remember, stick that on Y, then we can see that we've got our, um, our two objects in. Now you can see that you can only see the sails on one side, and that's because it's not shelled. That's not, it's not shelled on purpose, I don't want it to be shelled because I wanted to use a um, V-Ray two-sided material for this object, so I didn't want it to be shelled, and, it, and the V-Ray two-sided material only works with single-sided surfaces. So what we can do here is we can go to our subtool, which is just underneath our load tools above our geometry. We can now see that we have got two things, and you can see that it kind of highlights one when you're working on it. So it's quite nice, because you, kind of, you can work on a quite a complex thing um, with multiple objects and subtools and things like that, um, and then work on things separately and you can even hide elements. I think if you turn on transparency, it shows you, um, you know, the objects that you're working on and the other objects in transparent. Uh, there's lots of different viewport options to, um, to display things. So if you want to just work on the boat and not worry about that, then you can just turn them off there. Easy. Um, but what we do, if we, if we ignore the, um, those uh, sails for now, if we kind of just enter Dynamesh mode now, we'll see what, we'll see what happens. Let's just zoom into our canvas a little bit more. So Dynamesh was in uh, geometry. Dynamesh. We don't know what resolution we need yet, so let's just click on Dynamesh and see what happens. Blah. So <laughs> we need a more resolution in this. Um, again, I find this really annoying. I find this number abstract and annoying. Sometimes like 20 will be too high and sometimes 300 will be too low. It's, I find it a bit annoying. Um, but you can see now when we increase this resolution what we're kind of getting, it's basically fusing everything together. It's kind of welding everything together in a kind of like organic way. Um, but let's again increase this resolution. So yeah, now it freaks out at a thousand. It's, it's just, uh, it's, it's, I find it really um, unpredictable. We just adjust this until we get the right result that we're looking for, basically. Um, this might be too high. It's not too bad, actually. So you can see what it's kind of doing. It's kind of um, giving us that kind of really nice, kind of almost um, rusted effect instantly. So it, it may, that those models look like someone's been working on them for ages, or it's got some really elaborate... Um, a pasty map, but it actually wasn't too difficult at all. It was generated like this and then painted very quickly. Um, and you get this quite, even some of the kind of glitches in it look quite nice. Um, like on the car, you get this kind of almost like paneled kind of effect and it, all the rusted bits are kind of fusing together and all the kind of elements are kind of smooth and welded. Um, but we have to watch out because this is now eight, nearly a million um, polygons, which is fine, I guess, because it's quite, it's quite a feature, big, big thing. Uh, and we can add more resolution once we're happy. So say we're happy with that level of Dynamesh. Everything's kind of smooth in a nice way. Um, and we'll turn that off and then we can start actually dividing um, this thing a little bit more. Um, and the way, Sometimes when you, um, I don't think we actually did it for these models. Um, if I open up the other scene, the finished scene, sometimes what we do is we um, add, a, the, add a turbo smooth modifier just before the um, displacement modifier when you're using the V-Ray um, displacement modifier. And what that does is you leave it on um, viewport iteration zero and render iterations to say two, um, and then it will kind of really smooth out the displacement a lot and that would help for um, if this was our base mesh um, and we wanted the effect of this a little bit smoother um, 
then we can kind of add our, add our um, Turbo Smooth modifier, which will smooth things even more, and then displacement added, added to that um, Turbo Smooth, basically, to give it a bit of extra help with the, um, with the subdivision of that geometry. But I really like the way that this kind of fuses together and we get this kind of rusted effect. And it was kind of a happy accident, really, so um, that's a little kind of secret there. Um, but yeah, again, for texturing this, it's in this. I'm not going to go through the whole process again, but it was very, um, you know, I think we have these maps already exported, so I'll, I'll let you see. Um, if we look at the textures, if we go back to ZBrush masks, look at our boats, and we already have some kind of textures exported, with lots of metals, um, different things that we, we used <coughs> to kind of create that kind of rusted look. So if I open that one and kind of plug him in, and then I'll load an alpha, um, maybe this one, or um, yeah. So different alphas were created to kind of give different different effects. Some more kind of larger ones like this, which were much more for kind of the overall plonking down of textures. Um, and again, just to kind of show, like I'm painting on this now, but you can paint on your object before you UV map, but none of that is going to be any relevant, basically. So just if you start ZBrush, just like I am now, and they're just getting in there and starting to paint stuff, just you're going to have to do all of that again, because you're, this, this, this has not got any reference to where these, this poly painting is on any kind of map that's saved anywhere. That's the problem. Um, so before you do that, so if I leave that texture on now, uh, that I've done there, and if I then go to UV map, this will take a while because this is a stupid object, basically. This is um, this is a stupid object that no one really should be using um, in a in ZBrush, and this is just the way that we work. <laughs> um, we work in stupid ways, but it's, it works for us. Um, but I don't think um, normally you'd work with such a large, complicated object as one mesh. This would again be broken up a bit smarter so that you still get that kind of fused effect in the areas that you want it to, um, but maybe like um, the kind of the elements could be separated out in Max first, so that, yeah, again, because I like this, I like the way that the mesh is kind of fusing everything um, and the way that it looks, but we could maybe have um, the, like all the wires separately and all of the, um, this bit separately. Um, so that we have more subtools and more painting to do on different objects, but then that the resolution of the map goes further, and the um, it's not just one object. But anyway, uh, and then they, yeah, they'd be quicker to UV map again because I'll, I'll try this. But let's just see how how long it takes. Um, it might be too long to wait. Some of these things, I just leave it for a while, <clears throat> and it um, and it just does it eventually. So create. PUV tiles, so we have to be again, it's warning us, it's quite good because it warns us whenever we make mistakes. So we go to geometry, lower the subdivision to the lowest setting, um, and then go to our UV map, PUV tiles, current UV map size and border values. So look here. Let's just delete higher so we're on one level. Try that again. Okay, that's interesting. Sometimes it has a problem with this number here. Um, so you'll have to either decrease or increase this number for PV tiles to work, you see. I've now put that to three, and now it works. Um, so I think that's to do with the stupidity of the object. Um, I'm not entirely too sure. But I've always got it to work when either hiring or lowering that number, um, if you ever get that error message, basically. But it depends whether we're going to wait for this or not. I would like to illustrate um, the fact that the, this texture mapping will be messed up now because we haven't generated our object first. But I might illustrate this on a simpler, on a simpler object. What I wanted to show here is just how, the, how this effect was created. And when you have a thinly shelled object, um, what it does when you kind of start off with a Dynamesh object. If that shell was thicker, then that effect would be less. Um, so it's not like you will always have that if you start with a, um, a sensibly shelled object, but it just means that um, if you are working with thin surfaces then, um, and you don't want this effect, then you won't be able to necessarily start with Dynamesh. So you'll have to make sure that your, the base subdivision of your object is at a sensible scale. 
Um, I mean, it's very rare that you'd use ZBrush for kind of like large flat surfaces anyway, um, just because you don't want those surfaces to be like um, huge, hugely subdivided. Um, I think if you want to do custom painting on kind of like um, on more architectural flat surfaces, then I would recommend using uh, Mudbox for, for doing that. Mudbox doesn't work in the same way for poly painting. Um, they both have their advantages and disadvantages. Um, but Mud, Mudbox uses a different method of unwrapping and, and texturing, which you can use um, meshes with not, not anywhere near as, as dense a mesh. You don't need to have a really high subdivision mesh. Um, and the, the painting ability for hard surface stuff is a lot, um, a lot more advanced um, because it's used more for that. This is not, ZBrush isn't really used for that kind of thing. Um, so I'm going to show you this on a, on a separate, on a, on a show you the kind of UV mapping when, um, issue on a separate scene because this, is, this will take some time to pack. Because it's got to literally find squares on all of these little cables and everything like that. Um, and this is, yeah, not, not the most optimized of things to do, but it worked. We, we made like 11 of these things and it worked fine um, for us, for what we needed. And um, it was just being a bit more patient. Um, and again, adding that detail, because we wouldn't have really been able to create images like this or even this without that kind of extra layer of scatter that was kind of put on these things. Because there was, because of the size of some of these models, there were um, faceting um, even after the displacement because the map just couldn't be generated that size. So the, the adding the detail with the um, scattering is a really good trick to kind of have lots of um, have lots of detail in your model. So let's close this because that's going to take ages. Let's start another one. Um, let's work with something really simple just so we can really quickly illustrate a few things um, before we move on to the next element. So. Um, you can load any of your tools again, obviously, but you can also start with um, any kind of custom presets um, that you might want to start with. Um, so let's just put a ball in. Again, if I just keep working here, yeah, I'm kind of I'm kind of drawing in 3D, but this is ZBrush two and a half D. Um, so Control N, make sure you click on Edit, and then you can start moving around. Um, <clears throat> so. Let's just do something quick. Let's just paint a quick texture onto here. Please enter this. With any of the primitives in, um, if you're working with any of the primitives, you won't be able to do anything, sculpt or anything like that, um, unless you turn this into a poly mesh 3D. By default, all of the um, primitives will, will have that um, thing. So you just have to make sure that you, it will tell you, which is good. It says, please make it poly mesh 3D. So you, all you have to do is press make Polymesh 3D and you can start sculpting on that object. But um, yeah, let's go through a few things on a simpler scene just so we can illustrate a few points. So again, zoom the canvas. Um, so let's just paint um, a quick texture onto this. Actually, let's paint um, So we've painted this on to our model, but we haven't generated our UVs. So now when we go to UV map and um, let's make it a 4K. That one. Um, generate PUV tiles. <clears throat> Has that must have generated? Yep. Yeah. So then we go to um, I don't think it did actually. Generate UV tiles. New texture map. Okay, let's, we need to do that. Let's, let's paint again. Um, okay. We can see that it's just made the whole thing red. So that, that information that we did at the beginning, when we try and poly paint, it's just disappeared. It's made, it's made the whole thing um, red, which was our color we had selected at that time. And it's kind of overwritten whatever we've done, basically. So we just need to generate this POV task first. Um, Polypaint from texture. And then we can actually start painting properly onto our object. 
Um, and then remember to press um, in the texture map. Where are we? One second. In the poly paint. Uh, where are we? Let's just find that again. Yeah, sometimes the menus are hidden and it's just remembering where they are. So within create, um, new from poly paint, and then we can see that we've generated our, um, our texture there. But for objects like this, and or any symmetrical object for that matter, um, you don't really want to do this stupid map thing. You want, you want to, um, the, the PV tiles, you know, especially when it's a smaller object, you don't need to necessarily optimize the, the size of your, of your um, texture. Because this is good because it kind of gives you, um, it fills the, the size of your, of your canvas that you're using, um, but it doesn't really give you any ability to make any adjustments to that. Um, so what we can do is in our um, UV map, we don't really want to create PUV tiles, but we've set our resolution to about 4K, which is fine. Um, and then <clears throat> what we then might want to do is we might want to um, use the UV, UV master. And then let's just plonk him, um, let's plonk this over here. Any of the menus within, within ZBrush you can drag into the main, um, the main dock over here. So anything, the tools already in there, any of the kind of functions we can kind of like um, drag out into any of the spaces and make them more obvious. Like for example, um, we might want to have some more painting. Um, oops. Let me do it there. We can only have, we can only dock to this side. Um, but yeah, we can have any of these, um, any of these things visible. So let's go back to our um, UV master. Let's dock that in there. And then what we want to do is we want to unwrap this. Um, and ZBrush has got a very powerful um, UV unwrapper. Um, and then you can see what that map looks like if you flatten it. You press flatten. And we're kind of looking at like a flattened version of that model now, really. So this shows you what this is like. Um, so unflatten. Um, you can... Um, basically check the seams so you can see where that, that this object is going to be cut and you can edit those but basically what this is going to give you is a bit more of a, 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 a bit more of a um, of a UV map that you can actually um, edit in Photoshop and add more detail to if you don't want to do everything in um, painted in ZBrush which is sometimes you know more preferable so if, if I um, if I just start drawing on this now, and I go back to my um, new from poly paint. Let's just turn some of this off. Sometimes it can get a bit messy in here and too many menus. So new from poly paint, it'll give me a very different map. And that's what will be exported when I export to GoZ. Um, likewise with the displacement and the normal map, they should be, um, once you add, add some um, actual effects in here, or sculpt, then the, all the maps will be generated with that new UV that you unwrapped with the UV master. So again, it's just in plugins. It used to be a separate thing and it now comes with ZBrush and it, <coughs> it's, um, it's really good. If you have a complex object, you can still use this uh, and you can kind of paint where you don't want the seams and things like that. But it's, it's, just, um, it's just two different ways of generating maps within ZBrush. They're the two that we use and it really depends on what object you're, you're, um, you're working on to decide which is best. If you're working with a really complicated object like that boat or some of the rocks, then um, the PUV tiles is going to be better. It's going to give you a more efficient UV. Um, but if you're working on something simple like a head or, um, or anything like that, or something um, yeah, more simple, then you can use the UV master to generate your um, flattened UV. <clears throat> so let's just um, go to our Let's divide this a few times. Let's just um, really show obviously what the displacement will do when we bring it back into Max. So 
let's load displacement. For that, we need to go to the lower subdivision level. Displacement, create displacement. Go to normal map, create normal map. And you can kind of see what, what that's doing, or you will be able to in a second. Let's just make sure um, we'll close this down. Have our empty file open, and it should import into our empty file. Um, but they do recommend that you um, that you close Max down. So if we go to Gozi now with this, it should be very fast. There we are. Um, what I haven't really discussed much is that you can actually go back into ZBrush with the same object um, just by pressing Go Z again. So, if, for example, just to make this really obvious, um, you can kind of go back and forth. So, if I delete that bit and then go to Edit in ZBrush, it will ask you the topology of the mesh has changed. Press Yes to transfer high resolution details to the modified mesh. Press No to delete high resolution details. So that's really good because we can then edit our original object, but keep all the details we've been working on apply to this new mesh. This might be a bit funny because we've just deleted a huge part portion of it, but you get the idea. Um, you know, it's it's not a solid closed object anymore, which is acting a bit weird, but it's still got that that painting and sculpting sculpting detail on, which is like really useful when you need to kind of edit edit the base mesh a bit more before coming back into ZBrush. Um, but let's just undo that. Get rid of that. So let's actually add a small amount of finer detail to this so we can see what again, um, illustrate that displacement again um, before moving on to the next, next element. So let's work in um, the highest subdivision level we've got. Let's actually divide this again and again. And let's just um, drag a few lines, not quite as harsh as that. Let's get a different thing here as well. Let's add in some wavy cracks. Just to really illustrate very obviously the kind of process. Let's go see this again. The benefit of like when you're testing this yourself, um, yeah, work with kind of simple meshes so you can get really used to the workflow a little bit because uh, it will just, you can see the import option there. It will just really speed things up. So again, annoyingly, um, everything's mental ray. Um, not too sure why ZBrush support Mental Ray, but um, let's change this back to V-Ray. Let's check our material. Um, swatch this guy. Takes a bit of time because it's again, it's got this DirectX shader material, um, which is interesting, but not quite what we want. Um, let's just. Uh, change the uh so we already got tear display yeah there we go don't like that on um so it doesn't it's hard to say exactly what that does i think it just displays um it displays the material with um a bit more realism i guess with shadows and um i think it takes into account more more data than um, than the standard materials, basically, which is interesting. Um, but you can see here we have our seam. So if we didn't, we we, we have you have to have seams. They, they never they never render as obvious as that. But um, we have to have seams on a model. Be, it's just deciding where they are um, on that model. So if you're doing a head, that'd be kind of like the back of the head or under the chin or st stuff like that. Um, and you can kind of again in UV Master you can kind of paint those out. <clears throat> So let's just go to V-Ray Scene Converter, 
everything's V-Ray. Um, shouldn't have to do much, you know. Um, it's got our normal map, everything's in place. Um, let's just give this a V-Ray displacement modifier. Two D now. You can use two D or three D. I've had varying results with both. Um, let's try the three D for this one just to see what the difference really is. I think they, they both work. Um, the two D mapping is an older method. The three D mapping is newer, um, and I think it really depends on the nature of your object on which one you go for. I'd experiment with both. They both have slightly different settings. So again, those materials were saved out in our crazy folder, which is filling up fast, you know, this is, this is already um, 2.6 gigabytes and we've only been testing. So um, you can see how really to manage this file um, with cutting everything out and deleting everything. You don't need the OBJs that it exports, but it just gives you that. So that if the GoZ fails, then you can always import the OBJ and it should have the um, UVs in the right place. Should have. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> that's... Um, Let's just create a new folder. Let's plonk these maps in here. And then I'm just going to copy this. Sometimes I use a few plugins for relinking bitmaps. Um, I haven't got any of those installed here. So I'll just use the asset uh, tracking and then just manually replace um, the ones that I used. be where I want them to be. <clears throat> so bring that back and then the displacement modifier um, bitmap. Let's just go to the same folder, load our displacement. And let's see what the parameters are with this one. Okay, so this one hasn't put the text map mim at minus one, which it needs to be, um, to read the, um, the gray levels as zero. Um, we have slightly different parameters, like the max subdivs and the edge length um, to the other one. Again, the amount and the shift, if you're working with um, a gray to black image, has to be um, the same. So this is currently one meter. Let's just first, let's just see what size this is. So this is a meter, so that's going to be a mental. Um, We'll change that to like 0.1, see what that looks like. And this also 0.1. <clears throat> Shift has to be minus, minus 0.1. Okay, let's just put a uh, standard dome in here. Just quickly set up a test run the scene. Let's just test that without the displacement for a second. <clears throat> put a, di a, um, a base in just so we can test things a bit better. Purple. So because our texture is pure white, it's going to give us a few, a few problems, but um, that's kind of irrelevant for this test. Let's just um, knock back the whiteness slightly. Let's 
and turn down our light just for their testing purposes. So, you see here what we're getting. Um, <clears throat> mental. Let's change that again slightly. So, yeah, we've got our base mesh. Let's turn the. Um, light off so I can see what's um, happening on the top and then we'll turn on our displacement modifier let's just do a quick test here We need to go to the, one of the areas where we added that detail. That would help. <coughs> it's kind of subtle to see on a white object. Um, Try and make this material slightly different. But the effect is that the displacement is there. Um, but what we might want to do is add a, like I was saying, a turbo smooth modifier, the render iteration to underneath the, um, the turbo smooth. Just go to um, one of these elements here. I think what I might do is just um, <coughs> color correct this map so it's not quite so um, white, so we can see what's going on. Make it like a gray. Might also illustrate that slightly better as well with the um, some ambient occlusion. Let's check our displacement map that it's working properly. We might have, um, out of interest, let's try this on 2D mapping and just see what difference that makes. Got some artifacts here. So we'll check the, um, the mapping of this. In the diffuse as a clone material. Rename this. Yeah, so it is mapped in exactly the right place. Maybe that's just not um, the, what the modifications we made were not evident enough because the um, the base mesh retained quite a lot of that kind of detail anyway. Let's just try it again anyway. Let's, let's have a little look. Let's turn this up.
So you can see with the ambient occlusion a little bit more clearly. Um, however, the um, not quite satisfied with how that displacement's working just yet. So what can we do to fix this? <clears throat> so you can um, increase the resolution. I don't think that's going to help as much. It might just be that it's too much. Uh, the point one might be a bigger, too big a scale um, for this. So let's have a look at what we've got in our ZBrush model. If we go to we're not really getting that in our model at the moment. So let's just have a look how we can bring some of that back in. Um, the texture map, let's have a quick check of that. So it hasn't got, actually, the things that we're actually looking for in there, because I don't think we updated the poly paint. That might be the reason why. So let's check this out. Let's. Um, Go back through our subdivision, oops, back through our subdivision layers. Generate our displacement again and really make sure that it's actually got that detail attached to it this time. So you can see that it's actually now added to the map. Um, so again, get on top of um, gen updating these things. It's very tempting to do exactly what I've just done there. Just kind of keep working, keep working. You've generated it at some point. You think the map is there, um, yet um, you haven't actually updated things before you go Zed. So, yeah, good, good to check the map. So let's go and go Zed that again quickly. <coughs> We don't actually want that mesh. We've already got a mesh. Actually, we do because it's it's actually because we're gozing and the object is the same name. It's just re it's replaced that mesh, but annoyingly, um, it's replaced everything with materials as well. So that it's re replaced the the uh, material editor to mental ray. And it's got the same materials. So we need to quickly adjust that back. And V-ray scene converter. This can be annoying when you're going back and forth. Um, you want to only really go back and forth when you're editing the geometry. Um, you shouldn't have to go back and forth when you're, um, when you're doing these things. Um, let's just swatch that material. So look why that's not switching. <clears throat> that's a little bit strange. Let's just um, figure this out quickly. Let's copy the maps first. Again, our normal map. Um, but let's not worry about our normal map. Let's try and get the effect with the displacement that we want at this stage. Copy and replace. I think Max is having a hard time. So let's put that material back on and then that should have been updated. Um, material map has. So let's look at that displacement again. Load that map in. We can see that it's got those details now that we didn't have before. Our settings have been remembered since the last time we used it, which is good. And let's just have another quick test. So you can see now, 
um, we've generated that detail back in our model. This is without the turbo smooth before the displacement. Um, let's just quickly make sure that this is on um, low thread priority for our internet users. And we'll also make this affinity slightly less so when we render it's not hanging. So let's add our turbo smooth underneath. Again, I always have render iterations rather than viewport. Um, similar trick actually as well on, on that kind of subject. If you, um, when you're doing a lot of subdividing, when you have to subdivide your geometry, it's a simple trick, but um, to not have to display that subdivision, you know, especially when you have this quite small in some cases. Um, you can simply uncheck display subdivision. And then it's, it's on there, but it's not, um, it'll never be kind of in the viewport. So when you render, you'll still have that, but not in the viewport. It's quite a nice little option. Um, so we've got our turbo smooth, we have our displacement. Um, let's turn this down slightly. And if you didn't have this on, if this was on zero, then the whole model would essentially balloon out rather than um, going up and down as you've designed it in ZBrush, basically. That's why, that's why this has to be minus and this has to be plus. Same way why this has to be minus and this has to be plus. So let's do another quick test of that. You can see here we're getting that fine detail now um, in our model that we weren't getting before. And it's, that's how essentially this, this system works. So you can see here all the kind of veins that we've kind of put in there, we're getting back. Let's let this finish. And I'd say that, um, yes, yeah, so that's, that's working nicely now. I'd say that you never fully achieve what you've set out in ZBrush at the highest resolution. Um, whenever you see really awesome um, pictures of things um, f that have been made in ZBrush, they're always rendered in ZBrush. Um, and that's something that character artists and stuff like that do. And it's not something we've ever needed to do. We don't, we don't have to render from ZBrush, um, but that's a whole nother that's a whole other story rendering in ZBrush, but it does have a very powerful um, rendering system within ZBrush. Um, but you can kind of really pick out the finer detail that you kind of um, inevitably never quite achieve in the same kind of way when you bring it back into Max with the displacement. Um, it never quite um, gets to the same level. Um, specifically in the, in the poly painting, when you're, if you're limited with um, your resolution size, Whereas in ZBrush you're not, you just paint on the polys. So whenever you have, um, <clears throat> whenever you have um, a really, really highly subdivided HD geometry, um, ZBrush will display all of that. Whereas Max will only have your 8K resolution limit. So um, yeah, be aware that you'll never get it exactly. Um, just this is the same quality, but the principle, the principle works, um, and it really helps when having the Turbo Smooth um, iteration before the displacement um, and just remember to um, let's try it on 3D mapping again actually now we've got the new map but yeah if you're using 2D mapping or 3D mapping the amount and the shift have to be um, exact mirrors of each other um, and then the min text map has to be a minus one in both both options as well let's just have a little check on 3D mapping and see what it looks like I'm going to turn my um, Uh, bucket size down a little bit 
and my optimized settings. So we're on 3D mapping <coughs> with our shift. This is the parameter that, that, what, that changes the quality of, um, of things in, in the 3D mapping. But let's just do a, a render on default and see what happens. So we've achieved a, a similar a similar kind of result with the with the 3D mapping. My understanding of the two is that the 3D mapping is faster. Um, it's faster to calculate 3D mapping and it has slightly better controls over the um, over the way the resolution of the um, of the map that you're using and the kind of way that it deals with edges basically. Um, that's my basic understanding of it. But I've used 3D mapping on like water displacement in the past and it's worked a lot better than the 2D mapping. Um, I'll actually be showing that later on in, some of the, in the scene setup of the poster image, um, how that scene was kind of set up. But I think this gives you a good base on the workflow between Max and, um, Max and ZBrush to kind of understand how to bring back your detail that you create in ZBrush with a lower poly model in, um, in Max, basically. So we've got back some fine detail there. And we can exaggerate this with the, um, the shift amount if we want. <clears throat> like if I made this 0.5, which is crazy, but. You get the idea. As far as I'm aware, all these parameters are animatable as well, so you can have some fun with um, how the displacement kind of works and animates if you're doing animations of something a little bit more abstract. So, the last thing I want to show you in ZBrush is um, is the Z-spheres, and that's how we generate a lot of coral, and this is just um, it's a completely different way of modeling things, basically. Um, and you, see you, have, you have different ways of modeling things for different purposes, you know, poly modeling to spline modeling to NURBS and things like that. And different softwares are better for different things. Um, whenever we'd use any kind of complex um, two-way curve modeling, we always use Rhino. Um, the Max isn't very good at um, NURBS, even with the kind of power NURBS plugin that um, we sometimes use. But for, th for this kind of modeling, um, for kind of coral things, um, it would take a little bit of time to kind of construct the poly of this, um, which in ZBrush you can do very, very fast, and you can have a lot, a lot kind of um, more control over the way that the um, the objects are smoothed. Um, and I think it's just it's a fun, it's a really fun organic way of um, of modelling. And I'll, I'll show you how a lot of these were created now. <coughs> so let's create a new scene. Let's um, just close ZBrush down. Open it again. It's to flush out all of that stuff we don't need, with the textures. And <clears throat> again, close this dude. And in our tool, we can have um, what's called a Z-sphere. And when we drag that in, like every other object, we need to make it editable and um, turn on Y. Now you notice with this is that it's got this kind of, it's very different. You're not really sculpting. On, on, um, on this. It's only got one option and it's essentially kind of adding another point. But before we do that, um, just noting where the um, symmetry tools are. Basically you want to um, uh, find it first. <coughs> Transform symmetry. So we want to activate symmetry. The default for that is X. So we can kind of turn symmetry on and it gives us our points here where we can kind of do things separately. Um, and what we can play with with the symmetry tools are um, if we just dock symmetry for a second, if we have a few more <coughs> options here. We can kind of, um, you know, we can symmetry it in lots of different areas. We can turn on X, Y, and Z, so it's symmetry everywhere. Um, we can um, do, where is it? We can kind of give it a radial count which is what we used quite a lot. If we, so we can then work in a Y direction with a radial count. 
um, of um, however many we want. And we can start playing around with this. Once you've built that, there's a few shortcuts um, that is very easy to remember. It's just the Q, W, E, R. Um, so Q is just to go back to adding more. W is, is move. You're moving that now, and it's moving it all symmetrically. Um, e, which is essentially scaling. And then R is, rota is um, kind of rotating, which you don't really need at this point. So if I kind of like have my move enabled, then I just kind of start to play around with this. And then I go back to Q and I kind of add more and moving. I'm creating these kind of armatures. They're almost like bones. Um, and this is very, very good for creating any kind of creature and um, creature model or um, or anything um, more sporadic or abstract kind of um, in our case kind of like these kind of almost alien trees. Um, but it, it, there's lots of different things that you can kind of start with um, modeling from this. And it's just thinking what is the appropriate tool for what I'm aiming to model model for. And a lot of things, the appropriate tool is Z-Spheres. They're incredibly powerful um, and they um, they're really fun and easy to work with, basically. And you can kind of like add points in, in different sections um, and really start adjusting the armatures and bones of the way that these things work. Um, and it's just a really fun way of working. And the, the, we generated all of the coral for the project in, in these and the, and, the, and the two sets of trees that were used, basically. Um, once you kind of have whatever shape you're looking for, the process, and this is not, this is a reversible thing, this is non-destructive, so you can go to your adaptive skin and then preview what that mesh is doing. And then you can also change the density of that mesh and you can also kind of change the, um, change the kind of mesh type. You can use a classic kind of skinning, see how that's working and you can kind of play with some of the features, some of the things here to kind of really change how, how it's working um, until you're kind of happy, that's slightly strange. Um, it's kind of how the edges are working, and it's just it's just a matter of um, playing with the features and seeing what meshing method is is working for you. Um, so this one tends to be a slightly more uh, gives you less features, but it's kind of it's simpler, I guess. It's more based on how your bones are set up um, more rigidly, uh, and then in the classic one. Um, if we kind of alter that back to how it was, you can kind of see how we can kind of create a slightly different result. And all, all of this is, you know, a base for um, a base for adding detail in ZBrush. Anyway, so once you've, um, you know, you can kind of turn off preview and then keep editing your base mesh because that's just setting your mesh parameters basically. Um, so I, I'm happy with. I'm kind of happy with that base parameter, so I'll then continue editing and adding detail to my um, to my mesh. I might add some points in here, and it really works with the amount of bone. It kind of the mesh is dictated by the, the amount of bones you have and where they are um, to kind of get a smooth result. So you might have to have more bones at some of the jointed areas um, to create a slightly smoother result. Um, but it's literally. Um, you know, as whatever you can imagine, basically, you can kind of like create in, the, in this thing. So you might want to kind of scale these things, scale it up here, <coughs> um, and create some quite strange things. Again, this is kind of more used um, for kind of characters. You can kind of create and pose um, characters very, very quickly with this um, just by pushing and pulling um, different elements. Obviously, Octopuses and more organic kind of creatures are um, are the main purpose for this thing, but um, yeah, we 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 used it in uh, in the way we did. So you can see what we're doing there. So every time you kind of add in points, you're kind of changing the way that that is going to skin. And it's always good to kind of um, go back and forward with um, with the skinning to see how it's reacting, moving elements around. Again, you might you don't want to sometimes move the individual points, but you can move the whole armature, which will then move everything above it as well. Once you're happy with your base mesh, um, you can work on it like any other model, really. Um, what you will probably end up doing is make 
PolyMesh 3D. It's not very wise to start sculpting on this um, when it's still got the kind of bone, the bones and, and things like that in there. You want to, um, when you want to work on these things is com by converting it to a PolyMesh 3D. So again, now we're working it on it like it was a normal model, as if we'd made it in Max. Um, but we can very, very quickly, quicker than Edit Poly, um, put together some forms um, to start sculpting with, basically. Um, and it doesn't have to have symmetry and be or, uh, like this. It can be any, any, absolutely anything. Um, so yeah, from here we can start doing what we've been doing all morning, which is um, adding detail and, um, and sculpting and painting and exporting in, in exactly the same way. It's just a different method of kind of starting um, to kind of create geometry, basically. So were there any, were there any questions so far uh, with anything I've covered in ZBrush? To do with the, anything to do with poly painting or the um, ZBrush armatures or, or the Z-spheres I'm showing here? Okay. Cool. Well, we'll take a 15 minute break um, while we gather the... We're at lunch now, yeah? Okay. All right, we'll break for lunch then now and then um, we'll return and talk about the scene setup of the three different files. <laughs>